working. Welcome to the Wisdom Check by Tabletop to Keyboard. This is going to be our bi-weekly podcast where we discuss things such as Dungeons and Dragons. Actually, I think maybe we need to turn up my mic a little bit, guys. How about some more game? More game. This is the intro to end all intros. Talk about dungeons, dragons, and kids. Now, now, I don't think that's proper. This is a family show, after all. This is the intro we can use, fellas. It's good, clean fun for everyone. Welcome to the Wisdom Check, where we have wholesome conversations about the dilemmas we face every day. Nah, nah, hold on a second. I got your intro right here. Yeah, that's better. Welcome to the Wisdom Check. Well, I'm right, just wrong. We're going to have guests on to talk about it. It's going to be awesome, because I said so. He is right. He did say so. I don't know. Is surf music the best music for a podcast about D&D? Fuck yeah. Okay. This just in. Nobody can agree on our intro for this podcast. So we're just going to start. Welcome to the Wisdom Check. Roll for initiative. Fuck. A one. It's like every time. All right. We should be live, everyone. Hey, hey. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming to another episode of The Wisdom Check. And as always, I am Jeff over here on the uh, red screen. Across the way, we've got Dustin, my ever regular co-host over there. And you may be noticing somebody really awesome in the center here. And that is our very own Satine Phoenix, who's coming to oh, join us and share all kinds of excellent wisdom. So um, we're going to go ahead and just jump right in, I guess, at this point. So a lot of people have been really interested in hearing your take on things. And if they haven't already come across your stuff, it's it's kind of a shock to me because you've been pretty popular along the uh, gaming community these days and uh, be kind, of, kind of becoming kind of an ambassador for everybody and presenting an awesome face for gaming. So the first question I guess I have is, how in the world did you get started gaming? Well, I've been playing for over 30 years. <laughs> 31 years I've been playing. I found uh, one of the starter boxes in my parents' basement, and it was really funny because the basement itself mm -hmm. was like maybe a tiny little closet room that was like walled and carpeted, and then it just opened up to the entire rest of the building. Like oh, wow. everything was on the second floor, so the bottom floor was just a den, a weird closet thing, and then the dungeon, which was like exposed rock and and beams and i had to actually now that i think about it, i went into that area unearthed the box and inside wow. of this box were games and inside of one of those things was the D D. and so i played that when i was eight and then uh that was 1988 and i played it by myself i made all the stories Man. i made characters and then i found a D, &D group when i was 15 it was all my uh, theater friends and they were like i saw them playing and i was like i'm playing with you and they're like okay <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty familiar that was uh, our own dm uh, was on here a few days back and he was saying his intro was kind of similar he was at a you know theater kids you know and seeing people playing in the back and being like i don't know what this is but let's watch and get involved and you know i find there seems to be a lot of overlap between theater kids and gaming you know, I don't know if that's like universal. I mean, I wasn't a theater kid, but I was definitely a geek. You know, I was definitely the uh, the band geek. And like, I did play some sports, but not a ton. And, uh, you know, f I don't know, with Dustin, like, what was your intro there? He was well, something similar? Or? Growing up, I was, I was way too cool for this stuff. Um, <laughs> I was a jock. I played basketball, you know, most of my younger childhood, basketball, soccer, you know, football in high school. And, um, I had a lot of friends that uh, in a lot of different circles and some of them started getting into stuff I wasn't all getting into. I was no, no, no. And so I uh, <laughs> ended up starting to hang out with uh, some of these guys that, man, 
25 years later, we're still playing games together and doing <laughs> these things now. So, you know, we've been a, we've been a long, we've been a long-term group, but I didn't start playing until high school. So, mm-hmm. you know, some of these guys like Levi started playing like even before then. So yeah, I, I feel mean, like I was, I feel like I was a late comer to the group you know, <laughs> in high school even. So yeah, for my own, like my parents are, you know, not gaming geeks, but they've definitely run the gaming circuit, you know, so they do all the conventions, dads and artists. And uh, so I grew up around Trekkies and, you know, all the sci-fi crew and then, you know, looking at artwork and all that kind of stuff. And I fell into gaming pretty early. I think it was like five when I came across it. And so like, I'm trying to remember if it was Dungeons and Dragons first and then Elf Quest of all things, but it may have been the other way around. But there was definitely a very early time where Elf Quest was like a little gaming thing based on a comic that my sister was into. And for some reason, our babysitter had it. Like, this is like super small town, you know. Who, who in the world has gaming books in this town? Apparently it was her. And so I kind of got into it, you know, telling stories for my sister and then found people that were definitely much older generationally than I am that kind of got me in. And then, you know, stumbled into some more of our friends here at high school and we've been gaming since. So, you know, 1988 might have been about the same time. I think you're ahead of me a little bit there, but. So we're like lifers. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we, we <laughs> put in some life, time. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool because it really, like, you know, it really shapes who you are. Mm-hmm. Some people get into it later and some people get into it early like us, but it really crafts the kind of person you're going to be by through exploration and mm-hmm. through testing out, like, your, what your boundaries are inside of the game and then realizing, oh, I could do this outside of the game. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really interesting place to collaborate with people on challenges that don't have real life ramifications you know like we talk about this every once in a while there's kind of like this magic box about gaming you know you get in there you could try things out you can make mistakes you can lose and it's not the end of the world you know but you can also Mm -hmm. succeed wildly at things that may seem out of reach in day-to-day life which is just really interesting you know like i don't know that i would have ended up meeting a lot of the people that I know, you know, had it not been for gaming, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely brought together different types of people in my life that, like I said, otherwise wouldn't have got along necessarily. I mean, we had people that were interested in like fixing up cars and stuff, you know, but they were gamers, you know, and we had jocks, but they were gamers, you know, and we had, you know, geeks and well, okay, gamer, but, uh, you know, so like, it's, it's kind of fascinating to see how all these different things are coming together particularly this day and age, you know, with the kind of modern boom of gaming, you know, and I would say like a lot of times these, uh, these shows that we've been starting to see, you know, Geek Sundry and all the crews involved in that, you know, have really been pushing gaming to the forefront, you know, making it cool yeah. for people. <laughs> so like, it's really funny. Cause I, w- I always wanted to be one of the cool kids. Cause mm-hmm. I wasn't in high school. I got food thrown at me. It was garbage canned. I was mm-hmm. invited to parties to be made fun of. So I could go cry running home. Then in college, right after college, um, I did some really crazy things mm-hmm. and I thought that was cool. I was like, I'm going to be cool. And then I was going to clubs and parties, mm-hmm. drinking a lot, doing drugs. And then I realized that like, I remember after like the second or third year of that, I'm like, this sucks. Like, <laughs> where are the people? Where yeah. why can't I, I want to have a good conversation and like come up with stories and interact with people. Also, I got tired of drinking and partying so hard. And it was really cool because just knowing that, like I had access to an entire world of debauchery. Mm-hmm. And all I wanted to do was play Dungeons and Dragons. And so when I moved to Australia, I got back into it. So I was probably out of playing D&D from like 2002 to 2007. Wow. Five year yeah. break. I can't and even then, imagine taking that long of a break from gaming. Yeah. Like, yeah, it was it was wild. And then my ex and I, because we were we did performances at clubs and stuff. And mm-hmm. we were like, well, we don't drink. All we do is work out. And we wanted to like meet adults. Mm -hmm. So we went to meetup.com in Australia. So it's like, okay, we're brand new. We don't have any friends. So we found a group and we're like, okay, so we're looking for other adults that play, not some kids, because that's (laughs) we're used to playing as kids. And we found a group of adults and mostly couples. Mm -hmm. And we went to uh, an international tabletop day and like for D&D. And it was really cool. 
And then after the second or third session, it, like we had all these ideas. It was going to be puzzles. It was going to be intellectual. And then it reverted all the way to murder hobos. And it was beautiful. <laughs> Doesn't it always? You keep, it's so hard to get away from the murder hobo train. It just, it's, it's how games just end up some. I, I don't know why that's the default, but that, that seems to be everybody's default to like slide slowly back to that without, you know, gripping tightly to the next thing. <laughs> well, we, yeah. we talk a lot about systems, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, a large chunk of those books are written about how do you kill other things. And True. not as much written about how do you talk to other things. <laughs> There's not as much in that. And there's yeah. a lot of, you know, that's, that's an yeah, interesting I... thing. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, after you. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, we talk about that too is, uh, you know, it, whether or not there should be systems to kind of like deal with role playing, you know, like, do you want it to be free and open where the rules aren't getting in the way? Or do you want something that rewards within the system? the play and the decisions and the the voice acting and whatnot that you might be taking and that's it's a delicate thing you know because i mean i will say well, we tend to go towards just freeform talking right because it's the role play is just in the moment you don't want to break it down with dice but there's all these different types of ways to make your character that could be social and you know be backed up with the system and stuff and you know that could be important too like well what's your take on that do you do you favor one or the other so um, in my home game that I mentioned to you guys earlier, <laughs> we are, it is our outlet. Mm -hmm. I, there's like kind of a story, but we're not really, I don't know if we're into the story or maybe we are a little <laughs> bit, but really we're there to just kick a lot of butt. And then, um, but on Sirens, you know, I like to craft story and this long overarching thing. And then all the guests, they have their own little mini arcs and mm -hmm. it's really intricate. And we're like three or four seasons deep and it's intense and characters are like like morphing into other things so oh, nice. what i love about dungeons and dragons is you have the rule books right mm -hmm. um but they're also guidelines mm -hmm. it, they are so malleable that you can just you can like add to them you can play them by the book or you can use them as an accent for the role play so now that i play games i run four games a month on my Patreon, soon to be wow. five, um, four, three camp, two full individual campaigns that are long form. Like I think one of them, they want to go to 2021, but like, <laughs> they've already planned it. They love it. That now they're trying to get two games a, a month. Another one is like a shorter art campaign. One is a Dungeon of the Mad Mage, which is out oh, yeah. of the book and the other mm -hmm. one is a one shot that i kind of come up with right on the spot oh wow and by having all of those plus my games plus all the convention games i play mm -hmm. whether it's on stream or you know at a table uh, off camera <laughs> i'm now i know of access to playing in all these different kinds of games yeah and it's all dungeons and dragons right so i think of all the the rpgs out there D, &D is like the one that serves the most um, ideas. Yeah, the most types the most of gaming. Dice. Yeah, I think we even yeah. started off like one of our first episodes was really talking about kind of the spectrum of gamers, you know, like, you know, from ROLL playing to ROLE playing, you know, and like where people fit into that kind of area, you know, what pieces of gaming really get exciting to them, you know, because yeah. like not everyone's one thing or another, but like, there are certain things that tend to pique people's interest, you know, like some people love puzzles, some people hate puzzles, you know, some people love social intrigue, some people really want nothing to do with it, you know, some people love combat, some people obviously don't want anything to do with it, you know, some people are very dice heavy, some people would rather no dice ever appear in their game, you know, so it's, people get whatever experience they're looking for, provided they could find a group that also kind of feels the same way. You know, and I yeah, think that's and it's really big. cool to see that on Twitch streams, right? Because mm -hmm. you guys have your Twitch, and and all these other people have their different styles. Mm -hmm. And by like, it's amazing to have the permission as somebody who's not playing on a stream mm -hmm. to do these different styles by watching. Like, oh, that person's doing it like this. Mm -hmm. I can do that. <laughs> like, there is you don't have to be critical role all the time. Right. Yeah, and that, that's an interesting. So arc there too and it looks like dustin was about to say something yeah i was gonna say so um we had we had stefan pokorny on and uh he was saying that 
style are so different because he's so old school with first ed D and D and you're very much fifth ed sort of player. So do you, do you find it, do you find it kind of um, different when you have to go back and play first ed in his game? I know you've played enough. You've, you've done like first ed then of that. Yeah, I, I'm very malleable. I just like playing with people. So (laughs) I don't have a style that I like to play. I'm amazed. And I also learn, I learn from all the people I play with. Mm -hmm. So through him, I learn about dungeon crawls and how to keep them fun and super intense. Mm-hmm. You know, from uh, other game masters, I learn about how to, like, Jason Carl for Vampire. Mm-hmm. I learn how to have that dark intrigue and that slow reveal of story. Uh, Ivan Van Norman, how to, like, scare the shit out of people, <laughs> you know? And, like, um, and uh, Zach Eubank has taught me a lot about just being super fun and playful and improv. <laughs> so it's really neat being able to play in all these games because mm-hmm. I'm now like, I'm so flexible, but I feel like I'm just compiling information and then I spout it out on GM tips. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the best way, you know, being open to new experiences, learning from each other. You know, because I, I mean, we've talked about this a lot, but we go back to our original games, you know, and as kids, we had no clue what we were doing. You know, we just knew what was fun to us at the time. You know, you look back on it, you go, oh, OK, that game was a little rough. You know, <laughs> there's some questionable elements in there, uh, you know, and then as you go into different games and different experiences with other players, like for Dustin and I, we spend a lot of time and we talk about this all the time. Our audience is probably sick of it, but we talk about uh, LARPing. So live action role playing. We did a vampire yeah. LARP. And we played in it for years. We also ran it for years down in uh, Champaign. And through that, I mean, you come across so many different flavors of game, different types of stories you can tell within that same world and, you know, persistent system. And uh, it definitely forced us to be better players. You know, we learned how to really embody a character. And that was something we never did really before playing Vampire specifically. And I don't know if that, maybe it's different for other people, but like, Dungeons and Dragons, when I was getting into it, really wasn't about character initially. That seems like kind of a newer development. Do you feel like that? Yeah, actually, I do. Over the last three decades, four decades, it's definitely been, you know, well, it all came from war strategy war game, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. over time, it's like how it was the split. Okay, mm-hmm. now we have these this army. Well, what if you're one person in the army? We'll play that. What if you get better over time now you're leveling up right Mm -hmm. and so like what are how do you like uh specialize this character and how do you go from just the stat specialization to the personality specialization Mm -hmm. and now in the last 10 years we've gotten like character development through you know voice actors playing them on stream so uh i love the fact that there's no rule Mm-hmm. You, if people don't want to play their character, they don't have to. They could just roll for whatever. Right. Um, but if they want to just be their character with sirens, I can literally put the characters in a room for three hours and they will role play and LARP the hell out of it. <laughs> yeah. Some and I have will... another table that doesn't, they, they don't want to at all. They just want to fight stuff. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's just knowing your audience there, right? When you're running games and just knowing what you have to feed those people to make them happy. So, it's always interesting stuff to see that play out. So as a game master, you have to listen to what they want. That absolutely. is the most important thing because you cannot force a story into someone. You cannot force people to role play. And mm-hmm. I, I used to think it would be super great if everyone just role played like, well, that actually makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Yeah. So figuring out like what is the majority of the table want and for the people who don't want to role play, how can you ease them into doing little bits so that they're not alienated from everyone else? And that's the dance that I like to do. Yeah, I would say like that, that, that was definitely the arc I went through is when I was younger, I was definitely extremely introverted, you know, socially awkward, you know, the whole nine. So getting in this trying to be social butterfly, I was like, I don't know about this. You know, like you want me a talking character? Like, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't feel comfortable with that. And then over time, I think practicing in a game setting has actually made me social in real life. You know, yeah, well, thank you, thank you. Um, but, you know, so like, I think that's definitely, it's, it's, it's an interesting conversation because uh, when we love something, we want other people to participate in it, right? So like, 
I think as people who are interested in role playing specifically and like voice acting and that kind of stuff, we assume other people are interested in that as well or would be, you know, so there's like, oh, if I could just entice you to do this, you know, and help you get in there, you're going to love it, you know, but you can't force somebody like you were saying to get into something just because you're into it. So, you know, looking for that feedback is really important. And, you know, with games that you've been in, have you made that like a formal thing where you talk to them or is it more of just paying attention, making your insight checks in real life? Oh, I'm really insightful. I've got a high mm-hmm. insight or high wisdom, wisdom insight, right? Oh, yeah. not, there I <laughs> just correct. messed the whole thing up. <laughs> well, it's all um, over now. <laughs> <laughs> we got her. We got her, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, usually, well, I do a couple things. So I have like two kinds of session zeros. Mm-hmm. Um, I talk to people ahead of time. I ask them to privately tell me what their boundaries are. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I kind of hear what they want to play. Mm-hmm. And then at the table, I give a rundown of like, um, this is what my my table rules are um, based on what your boundaries are. From mm-hmm. you know, This is the kind of game we're going to play. But then I do another thing, and this is exactly how I gauge their interaction, get them to start role playing together, mm-hmm. find out who is going to be the leader and who is like, oh, like sure. what the different categories are. Yeah. And it's all in a matter of like 10 questions in five minutes. Oh, wow. Yeah. So these and are very now, specialized then, questions, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do it for almost every single table, and they're almost the same. You're going through, uh, it goes, Basically, you're going from point A to point B and giving you a super short rundown. Point A to point B, uh, but you have to go camp over the night overnight because you, you know, it's too far. You get in the forest, you set up camp, suddenly a monster comes up. Mm-hmm. But I tell them to tell me what the monster is. Oh, okay. and the whole thing is like boom, 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 fast. Mm-hmm. And so each person gives something and they're like, um, 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 and I'm like, just say what, whatever comes out of, into your brain. And they're like, barbecue, like, okay. So barbecue, a uh, big thing of barbecue comes out. And why is it weird? Oh, it's weird because of this. How is it mutated? Oh, it's starting to like, you know, grow six feet. Okay. And what is it doing? That's weird. And then it chases them. Mm-hmm. They all lose something off their character sheet. Oh, no. They have to tell me what that is. <laughs> and when they do that, if it's really intense, like a sword, which they lose permanently for the whole game. Oh, wow. Then they get inspiration. If they lose like a bedroll, like that's fun, you know, mm-hmm. and that's okay. I don't punish them for not. I just don't give them inspiration. Mm-hmm. And then I say one person sacrificed themselves. Oh, Who wow. was it? So Ooh. then always somebody sacrifices. Everyone gets away. They make it to their point. They wait a week. Finally, the person comes and uh, meets up with them and tells them how they get away but before that happens they tell me what happened right in (laughs) front of everyone so how did you get away i got away because i ran and i chased them off they make it to their friends and they either tell them the truth or they lie to them but they're doing it in front of everybody and a lot of times they'll lie in front of them and the people like the players know that they didn't tell the truth and all of a sudden the entire group is having fun and they're Mm -hmm. being playful and they're having a really great time and they're also they've improved and they've role played without even meaning to that's awesome yeah i love these sorts of approaches like 100 percent of the time yeah this collaborative world building collaborative storytelling you know that it just like opens the door and says like, Hey, it's okay to come in here and create something. Whereas I think a lot of times players come into a space and they're like, Oh, well you're the DM, you make stuff and we're just here, you know? So I think it's awesome. Just like opening up the the floor for people, you know, like making that spotlight available. Yeah. And a lot of times I'll just sit back and like wait for them to talk and explore. And I'll just, I'm just there to facilitate the environment for them for when they want to, maneuver in this instance the key to it is this Mm -hmm. everything happens fast and i'll I'll snap my fingers and they don't even realize i'm snapping my fingers and they're like oh wow we're now keeping beat and we have a rhythm and they keep this rhythm all through the game i don't even have to snap my fingers anymore oh interesting and they just they're quick to make decisions they're excited i have them roll their uh, d20 and their damage at the same time so that they they're like so it's fast, into yeah. it 
they get disadvantage if the dice roll off the table, so they never, they're not sloppy with their dice. Good rule. <laughs> like oh, man. These, that's a great home a rule right little, there. <laughs> that, that's a wisdom check right in man. itself, man. <laughs> Levi is writing this stuff down. He's in the chat already. He's like, I'm writing all this down. He's going to start snapping this Saturday on stream. You guys will watch it. It'll happen. He's going to start snapping that. Well, it's funny. I do another thing where if you're like, if you're going to cast a spell, or mm -hmm. if it's your turn, if you don't make a decision, I do the mom thing. Oh. I say three, two, one. And so they suddenly make that decision. But I'm saying it to adults, right? Mm -hmm. And I have a Filipino mom, so she definitely was like, uh, and I'm just like, ah! So I get this like panic in me. Yeah. But I get this message from my girlfriend from Fury's Reach. That was like the one of the first streams I ran. Mm -hmm. And she was like, she's an actress. She's used to scripts. You know, uh -huh. When she, she's on uh, in front of the camera, she's on it because there's a script. Mm -hmm. Not really, She doesn't really improv. She sends me a message and is like, I'm at the grocery store. And I'm freaking out because I don't know what to get. And all of a sudden, I hear your voice. One, two, three. And I just picked it up and I made a decision. <laughs> <laughs> that is the ultimate secret. So speaking of chat, um, I can't see the chat tonight because I'm running the stream. Uh, but we minutes. have been talking about doing sub-only chat tonight. So if you have questions Ooh. for Satine, you have to be a subscriber. And I believe we have some questions already. Do we want to get into some of those? Well, I thought we would go ahead and start with getting into Destination Fantastic and her Absolutely. other projects first and handle the questions at the end of the stream. <laughs> Which, by the way, cool. if you guys haven't heard, there was a uh, Kickstarter that went on. We helped support it. And uh, it was freaking awesome. Like, the, the, seeing in the last few days, like maybe a day and a <laughs> half, suddenly that thing rocketed to completion. And uh, you guys are getting your first episode finished up, which is going to be yeah. cool. So for some of these people, it may be the first time they're hearing about it. Uh, so could you give us a little rundown of what, what they could expect from Destination Fantastic? Yeah, so Destination Fantastic is like a National Geographic style documentary series where uh, I guess it's a travel show, right? Mm -hmm. So Stefan Picorni and I, we go to a, a country Mm -hmm. And then we research the mythology and we actually go in and interview museum curators. Um, we talk to experts in the field of mythology, but we also like go into the land and talk to the people. And it's really important because the whole thing is based on like what inspires us as artists and storytellers. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a classically trained art. I don't know if many people know this, but he's like Italy classically trained artists. Really? You know, he's, no, I didn't know he's that. He's like a master yeah. painter, sculptor, a fine artist. Um, That's I awesome. I think he has some of his stuff. He's also like a metalhead and he's yeah. really goofy and fun, but he's he is a storyteller. So when we go to Iceland, which was our very first episode, um, we, we are both inspired by uh, Tolkien, mm -hmm. right? Lord sure. of the Rings. Gotta be. Fantasy, I mean, if you play D&D, right? right? Where everything began. Exactly. <laughs> So we got, to, we went to an institute and uh, got to touch and read from the, I'm going to murder this word, the Codex Regius mm -hmm. and the Sagas by Snorri. These are things written in like 1200 that like shaped our world of fantasy or like the fantasy genre that we know today. And we, we did stuff like that. We interviewed the fairy lady who talks to fairies and trolls and hidden folk and she explained all this stuff. We hiked glaciers. We went into a volcano. Oh, and my it, God. And it was amazing. And what we're doing is, like, immersing ourselves into the terrain and into this world, trying to understand, like, why are the people so hardened? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's a land of fire and ice, literally <laughs> volcano and glaciers. And why is why are they so like that? And what kind of food do they eat? You know, what would they serve at a tavern? <laughs> There's a good story yeah. there, apparently. Oh. Not, not your standard tavern food, we take it. No, nope. <laughs> nope. The fermented shark is rude. Oh, there's also other things that I ate that um, I never thought I would eat. I'm gonna I just put this out there <laughs> fermented meat yeah, so this, does not seem like a good thing. About, oh, god, there's so many things <laughs> oh. scarred because I'm like, I'm ballsy, I will eat whatever, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe not so much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you found your match, you had to, you yes. had to go out and explore the world to find that you know, you, you have a boundary. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's true. 
one one bound one food but will yeah, not be eaten really cool. <laughs> actually it was like a lot of little things oh, that no. i couldn't believe i was like this exists but it was really magical and it, like for being somebody of mixed race like i mm -hmm. am i've never really been like other than your you know dungeons and dragons fantasy i never was interested in like the nordic culture mythology mm -hmm. right i just I'm filipino sure. i'm interested usually interested in my own mm -hmm. but i have this whole new appreciation just sitting there on this woman's land plot of land in her mm -hmm. newly grown druid forest looking at the mountain range going holy mackerel if at any point a dragon could have just you know was the mountain and could have gotten up and shaken off a bunch of trees and, and rocks and just flown away. I would not have been surprised at all. Man. And, so and meanwhile, bring all of that to you guys. And that's what destination fantastic is. And then at the very end of the show, mm -hmm. uh, we meet up with other gamers and, uh, we play a D and D game. Oh man. That's, oh, that's so awesome. Good. Yeah. Meanwhile, so, we're from central Illinois. So if we saw a hill, a corn. we would believe that was mythical. <laughs> in and of itself. I'm still, I'm still waiting for D&D &D to put out their corn dragon. It hasn't happened yet. So. <laughs> the, That's really fun, One of these days, actually. maybe. The corn golem. <laughs> you know, some, we'll get something. One of these it's all ears. It's really weird. <laughs> so um, so the, that, that was Destination Fantastic. We have the very first episode, but we want to go everywhere. We want to go to New Zealand. Uh, it'll, we want to go to everywhere. Mm -hmm. Peru. Um, I heard Malta. Oh, it's yeah. really cool because they have like stuff from 12, uh, I'm sorry, 2000 BC. Man. They have history that dates all the way back to there. And I'm like, you know, art history is what I was into mm -hmm. in college. But now I'm just, and maybe it's because I'm older and I just, I'm really into studying and what stories are based off of. And well, the idea of like writing and being a storyteller and perfecting my craft as an artist. And now it's like, we basically are a new Joseph Campbell. I don't know if you mm. guys ever watched the Myth and Symbol. I know, um, I didn't I see that one. No. that one. So yeah, uh, Joseph Campbell is the reason why Star Wars uh, 6, 7, and 8, were, uh, sorry, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 were so good. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a consultant, but he was like the master storyteller. He wrote a book called The Hero's Journey, mm -hmm. which is I'm what sure, all yeah. of our stories are based are, on. Yeah, right, which yeah. have to be. Yeah, so um, a lot of what I do as a storyteller is I use that model, the hero's journey, of, like mm -hmm. what you would read in a novel or what you see on TV, and I take that into my games. Yeah, so, sure. um, but his he had the series called The Power of Myth and Symbol, mm -hmm. and it is phenomenal. I think it's on Netflix now or Amazon Prime. Highly recommend okay. it. I mean, it was like from the 80s or something. Wow. But I still have it on VHS. You can't see it, but I have a collection of VHS over there. <laughs> There's probably some people in our audience that don't remember what that is. <laughs> so Joseph Campbell is like the master storyteller. And if you don't know him, go check him out. I will because, definitely. Yeah. That's awesome. I've not yeah. heard of the Hero's Journey, but I guess I, I've never heard of the name associated with it. So. Um, yeah, so I talked about guys... it in GM Tips on Geek and Sundry. There's like a whole episode on it. Oh, that's cool. awesome. So your guys' Kickstarter got you episode one finished. Mm -hmm. you, you'd been to Iceland, you got everything finished up. So are you, do you then, you have now a pilot episode. So does yeah. this pilot episode then, do you get to take that to like uh, National Geographic or, you know, home, like all these, do you go to a station and say, hey, look, fans made this happen can you get us put us on TV or do you go back to Kickstarter and say, Hey, we want to do some more episodes. Let's keep this thing rolling. Like, where do you go from here? Do you know? Um, uh, well, so Stefan and I are the hosts and this is our show, but we actually have an entire team, a production team. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the director is amazing. Uh, Josh Bishop, he's brilliant. And, um, the producers are amazing. They do all of that. Oh, okay. Okay. So that's nice. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of opportunities now where, you know, we can shop it around or we can say, hey, we want to make another one once this is finished. Like, we want to make another one. We want to go to New Zealand and mm -hmm. look into that mythology and bring that out. So we have a lot of options now since we funded the first one. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I mean, it's so up in the air where it goes next. But at least we have the first one done and it's a really nice introduction. It goes like, it's the journey of um, 
like it talks a bit about who we are and then goes into us going to the Tolkien premiere here in LA and then nice. uh, making our way over to Iceland. And yeah, it's, it's a journey. Man, so that's we'll awesome. see what it's huge. Yeah. I'm, I'm almost done with the, um, the, my rewards mm-hmm. for it. So I did a bunch of, uh, four archetypes. It was like a, a wizard, a cleric, a rogue and a barbarian taking selfies in front of the uh, Iceland landscape. Nice. Yeah. Do you have any examples of your art that people can see that are like handy or is that a. I do. Yes. <laughs> I can take you with me. Oh boy. <laughs> oh, we're going on. A, we're going on another journey. Going on this is journey. becoming a regular I was thing. Say, on this the is a destination. Fa- fantastic. Thing. To take us around. So can you see me? Oh yeah! Oh, that's nice! Fantastic! So, yeah, that's mine. Oh, very cool. And then cool. there's uh, a lady from League of Legends, LeBlanc. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then here is a life drawing because I used to run a life drawing class at Meltdown Comics. Oh, cool! Let's see, I had a lot of stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those are awesome. Um, yeah, I've got a bunch of like Doctor Who paintings, but if you want to see all those, you can go to BurningQuill.com burningquill.com we'll yeah. definitely have that so, in the chat here somebody could put that down yeah because so, i don't know if a lot of people know but i'm a uh i'm a an artist i went to the academy of art for five years and i'm i have three graphic novels and a nonfiction. well yep, it, it's almost me. like you're a big deal <laughs> you've yeah, done a little bit of everything me pretty amazing yeah, stuff yeah. like Thanks. Thanks, definitely man. i mean because it takes a lot of skills to come together and be a good dm you know like it, it's it's an art form in and of itself and like the creativity has to be there and clearly you've got it you know so yeah that was the cool thing about college right mm-hmm. like i think most of what i learned i learned in college and mm-hmm. i know that you like i dropped out of college after five years but i felt like i learned a lot in five years um <laughs> But a lot of what they teach in art school specifically Mm -hmm. is work ethic. Yeah. Because it takes hours and days to make a project. And you have to sacrifice, you know, a lot of stuff, which is what I do even till, you know, 20 years later. Mm -hmm. Um, They teach you how to hear creative criticism. Boy, that's a big one. (laughs) That is huge, right? Mm -hmm. To be able to listen when somebody is like, oh, this and that, and then how to digest it. Mm-hmm. And what to use from that yeah. without offending other people because you, you know, you don't want people to feel like you're ignoring what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know that you're not perfect. Right. You know, so, you have to have some like really tough skin, I think, to get through art school. Like I can only imagine, you know, cause uh, yeah. other types of work, like I do like, computer science stuff. So like when I write a program, I get attached to that and that's a, it's creative, but it's not like your soul being presented on a piece of paper you know when i look at artists it it feels like that it's just like they're just dumping themselves into a medium and saying hey do you like this and so like that criticism has got to be very difficult like how did you get through that it's i think even more than that is you hear it it's like the more repetition is key Mm -hmm. right art is about repetition it's muscle memory Mm -hmm. and it's understanding that the next thing you do is going to be better Mm -hmm. so i was told game masters try it yeah if you suck the first time well you probably didn't but you're gonna be your worst critic Mm -hmm. because you are you're always no matter what you're gonna be your worst yeah for sure um next time you're gonna be a little better and Mm -hmm. next time you're gonna be a little better and next time you're gonna be a little better and eventually you'll be much better yeah, I think everybody should try it is, at some point. Oh, absolutely. You know, even the if, other thing I learned from art school is mm-hmm. chunks. Oh, okay. Like homework, right? <laughs> so you know, if you take a class, you have what six weeks or eight weeks? I have no, I don't remember. It's been twenty years. You have, you have a certain amount of time. Twelve <laughs> weeks in a class, so yeah. you're going to go through at least six different projects, mm-hmm. at least, or whatever. I don't know. It's been a long time. Um, <laughs> So knowing that there's an end date to whatever mm-hmm. you're doing, I see so many game masters. I've been working on my thing for 10 years. Yeah. I'm like, really? Yep. Because you could have been done like, like last year, <laughs> yeah. you know, or you, you could start something new and be done in three months. I think that if you the... know the process and know how to stop. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. I think the issue 
you know, once you, you let a project go and you're like, oh, I'm going to put a little bit more time into it, suddenly then the pressure is that much higher for it to be good. And then it's, oh, I, but then I really have to work on it, you know? And the next thing you know, it was 13 years and you're about to put out a tool album. <laughs> well, there's some exceptions. Yeah. <laughs> but even within that time, right? Like, yeah. Um, and you can have your opus. Mm -hmm. You can have your opus running, but your opus is only going to get better if you do other projects that are short term because right. nobody like puts 100% into one thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I, that's a lie, actually. <laughs> that's how I did my graphic novels. But <laughs> um, at, in the beginning, even that, right? Like mm -hmm. that was, okay, 72 pages in four months from start to finish. I spent a year doing the story for 27 issues. Wow. And so I was like, okay, that's a year. I built it out. I built the framework mm -hmm. so that all I was doing was production, right? Man. Now you have World Anvil. Mm -hmm. Boom. Right. I don't know if you guys know about World Anvil, but oh, worldanvil.com yes. is like brilliant for world building and getting your stuff together so that you can see it and you like, yeah. and they have all these cool prompts to teach you how to uh, make your story. Oh, right? And how to like, yeah, mm -hmm. it's phenomenal. I wish I had that in college. <laughs> so is it like sure. the, uh, like you put an idea out and then ask you like why or like just like little prodding questions or like what, like what is it doing? Well, it's even more in intense. So it's a wiki for mm -hmm. your project. So it's like um, you can start with an article or you can have like a map or you can have whatever it is, whatever information. And they kind of mm -hmm. guide you here at the beginning steps. And then from there, you can elaborate. And here's some more detailed information. Uh -huh. And then here's some more detailed information. You can add more people and you can link more people to more articles and more locations gotcha. and more scenarios. And then you have your campaign. So you can actually use it if you just want to make a story for a comic book or a mm -hmm. TV show or whatever. Or you can use it for your campaign and uh, build out everything to the point where you have game masters can see this players can see this and you can like reveal things over time oh that's very cool <laughs> it's so sad. world anvil is pretty cool stuff we have a few people in our discord that have been using it and posting some updates on their stuff and i've been kind of peeking at it and taking a look it does a lot of amazing things so it, it yeah. is really cool for all of you out there who may not have uh, looked into it yet it is definitely worth your time so um we are starting to get a few questions in here from a few subs that are related to some destination fantastic stuff so i thought we'd go Excellent. ahead and maybe knock one or a couple of those out real fast yeah let's do it before we move on to her other topics here. And the first one is coming from, let me find again, uh, Ink and Ignorance. He asked, um, why Iceland first? Why'd you, uh, why'd you decide that for episode? So we were going to do New Zealand, mm -hmm. but, oh man, when I moved to Australia, instead of getting two summers, I got two winters. Oh, no. What people don't realize is it's on the other side of the world, so it's opposite, right? Mm. May is winter. Oh, yeah. Brutal. <laughs> right, yeah. So you have to schedule your trips for when it makes the most sense. And Iceland is beautiful that time of year. The mythology and then Tolkien was coming out. And mm -hmm. so um, our friends over at Legion M were like, come be a part of our group and come do the red carpet with us. And we're like, okay, well, between Tolkien premiere the Tolkien thread, mm -hmm. Iceland was the perfect place because he was, you know, obsessed with that mythology to the point where we went in and we were reading from the book mm -hmm. from the Codex Regius and he's reading the words, like reading that about the light elves and the dark elves and all the uh, dwarves. Mm -hmm. And oh, is this a spoiler? Hey, we like know, spoilers around here, right? Yeah. A little sneak peek. Only yeah. ATT2KB we, fans get we, it. Are we about to get a scoop here or yeah, something? Yeah, pinky swear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, it was really cool because the name Gandalf <laughs> is actually a dwarven name. Wow. Yep. Oh, Found that idea. out by reading it from the source. I guess it follows the naming convention, right? Two, two syllables, you know, for the name. Two hard kind of syllables. What is this? Well, it seems like dwarven names are always two syllables. Or oh. in. Like two or one. Never oh, three, yeah, right? right? They're always a lot of them are that way, I suppose. 
that's I don't know I don't know hmm. if it's a necessarily a convention that's universal, but I guess it does work for for several of the token ones anyway. I've been known to pick yeah. out patterns that don't actually exist, so don't quote me on that. But <laughs> no, no, I think that's true. But Snorri Snorrelson, I can't remember his name. I just like I laugh every time. Like I laugh. I was gonna look up his name, but I, I'll end up giggling myself um, away. <laughs> Snorri Snorrelson. Snorri Snorrelson. Snorri, shit, I can't remember how to say his name, but like, yeah, just that name, right? That's and enough. He wrote these books, and it's like, I don't know if you've read them, but like, the sagas are crazy. They're like Jerry Springer meets so like um, Spanish soap operas. The original reality TV. <laughs> It's really crazy. I was reading it going, what the what? Well, I mean, even when you look at it, like mythology in general, right? You go back to like the Greeks and stuff. It was it was all soap opera back then because the only people, yeah. you know, people want to pay attention to even then are like the people that are just outrageous and crazy. I mean, like Zeus. Yeah, that's true. I mean, come on, look at that guy. <laughs> that dude's up to no good all the time. <laughs> so I know we had another question about... Uh, Part of the Kickstarter reward system there, and there was we one was item actually, in particular. It was actually that was about. ignorance again. He oh, asked it? about the storyteller's thesaurus. He actually mm -hmm. tried to ask this question to Stefan a couple weeks ago, but the audio we couldn't hear. I don't think Stefan could oh. hear us, and vice versa. So that that episode was kind of off the rails, and we never did get much of an answer on that. But I think he was curious about it, what exactly the uh, storyteller's thesaurus was going to be, or maybe you have um, knowledge of that. Maybe you don't. I don't. But, there are so many things up on that. Let's see. Um, I would ask that in the comment section in the Kickstarter. Oh, okay. Did you Where ask you it going? in the Kickstarter? I don't know. I, I don't know. Yet. He might have. He asked it here while he was with us last time. So we were we were just <laughs> following up on that question just because we knew it didn't get asked. But um, we do have another question coming in about uh, what's kind of related to Destination Fantastic. Said, uh, have you had the opportunity to explore the possibility of producing? Is it Kintsugi Globe dice for Destination Fantastic? So that is for Gilding Light, and my company's name is Gilding Light, mm -hmm. and it's about the art of storytelling, but the storytelling th uh, to heal us, right? Mm -hmm. So, do you guys know what Kintsugi is? I looked it up today. So yeah, I looked it up today Kintsukuro because this question came in. I had never seen the word before. So. See, I've seen these so, before. I didn't know what they were. So the whole point is that we are more beautiful because we are broken. And so this is Japanese pottery where if it's if it breaks or falls, um, you rebuild it with gold. Oh, man, that's cool. And let me okay. tell you, I got a lot of experiences. And I have been broken many times, which is why I wear all my jewelry. I mm -hmm. just feel like it really seals all the gaps for me personally. Yeah, so um, that's, that's what it cool. represents. And yes, there will be Gilding Light, Kintsugi. Um, ki, uh, kintsu, there's another word, Kintsukuroi. Kintsukuroi. Wow. Okay. Um, dice. But it is very hard to get them right. Cause, oh, because the balance would be all imagine. kinds of crazy, yeah, I imagine. Yeah, seems you have to worry about possible. Exactly. So it is taking a lot longer than expected. Mm -hmm. But for those of you who want Satin Dice, there will be some new ones, and I've been talking, I'm working it out with Level Up Dice. Mm -hmm. There are some dice coming out before Christmas that are going to blow your freaking mind. Like, <laughs> I've never seen anything like this, and I can't believe we're doing it. When you see it, you're going to be like, that's it, I'm done. You can do anything now. <laughs> wow. Can you tell us any yeah, about what they are that makes them so special? Oh, this is sounding pretty top secret. I don't know. Look at that it's face. Pretty top Look secret. at that face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's level up. Mm -hmm. So you've seen all their stuff. If mm -hmm. you haven't seen their stuff, go to levelup.com. But they have some really beautiful, amazing. I love all their gems, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So there is no way you could even imagine what these dice might look like. And I can't tell you because. They're so unique that, like, it, like I can't have anyone else taking this idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, yeah, so, for sure. Take we have a trade secret. Yeah. I'm not saying that we're sponsored by a competitor here, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm friends with them, too. And what yeah, I love is our people. community of gamers. There's one mm -hmm. girl who uh, 
dispel dice, I think. Hmm. Oh my god, she makes all these amazing dice, but she will not release them and is killing me. Oh, really? <laughs> oh. So, it, yeah. what's the deal with that? I don't know. I think she's, you know, it's like, it's not easy to make dice. And I know, no. like, there's a there's one uh, a group of folks that are amazing and super fun, but they have they get a lot of crap, you know, mm. because the fulfilling is hard. And if they mm. if you as someone making a product, mm-hmm. like you could get samples from your whoever you're producing, usually from China, because I'm sorry, that's just where things it's are made. Cheap, yeah. It's so cheap. Um, uh, if you you could get a sample and it mm. looks decent. And then suddenly get an entire batch that looks like crap. Mm. And it's like really hard because you can't say, give us our money back because you paid for it. Right. Oh, yeah, so yeah. it's just like there are wins and there are losses. I've seen big companies lose tons of batches of stuff. Man. So it's, it's before there were less people doing the things that we love mm-hmm. and they were doing it less complicated right right? now we have all these crazy ideas and we want to do things that are completely unique and that no one else is doing and (laughs) and so we come up with stuff and it just is really hard to make and now but there's no forgiveness for that yeah because people pay everyone pays with their hard-earned money right Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. but as somebody who makes products it's i understand how hard it is for sure so yeah there's it's a lot of hard to it. it. Really hard in a world of like Kickstarters where people are paying for their money before the product is ever completely done either. So like it's gotta be some of those projects I could imagine how hard that is to do. Yeah, exactly. Um and Kickstarters are hard because they're passion projects. Right. And sometimes they're very successful and sometimes they don't make it. Mm-hmm. But um I always say get as much done as you can before and then you'll have a more successful run. But like I said, you could have really good samples, but then the entire batch that you invested $100,000 in or $50,000 could be crap, but you still have to pay for it. Man, that would be a that yeah. would be a bitter wow. pill to swallow. Boy. Yeah, so, I know, right? So <laughs> like, I that's, to, like, that's when terrifying. I see stuff like that, I try to like <laughs> I like my whole thing is understanding where people are, where they're coming from, mm-hmm. right? Like you like it's just hard to exist in the first place. Mm. Second, it's hard to follow your dreams. Third, it's hard to get all these different variables to link up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I think I'm very kind because of that. You know, yeah, I think it comes from experience, obviously. I mean, you go through things, you come up with a, a different personality as a result that's more open and, and uh, forgiving and, and these sorts of things. Um, and I know you were saying this is kind of a central theme with this other business of yours. Um, care to elaborate on that a little bit? That's what gilding light, correct? Yeah. So, you know, I have a very interesting past, but I would never take any of it back mm-hmm. because it made me who I am. And by acknowledging all of that and I got in a car accident. I am not perfect. I have severe brain damage, which is, we talked earlier, mm-hmm. that's why I can't game past 10 p.m. Yeah. Because, like, I just can't think. But being honest about these things and showing people, like, I am not perfect. Mm-hmm. I'm absolutely not perfect. But I can, I want to put myself out there so other people who are not perfect can feel more comfortable. Yeah, representation so building right is about, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But also the reality of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like you two who are not perfect can do crazy things like rent a jet for your birthday and have your friends on it and play D&D on it. Like, (laughs) I can't believe I did that. (laughs) It's hard. That was my birthday and it was really hard and a lot of things fell apart, but we all scrambled up and we worked together and the community came together and it was remarkable. Remarkable. That's so good. So that's what it is. And it's also like, you know, being a woman Mm -hmm. and being a person of color who's like white also. Right. All weird. um, And being who I am. There's a lot of things I can't do because of what I've done in my past. Mm -hmm. I wanted a place where I can do the things. And maybe all the things that I do aren't like what everyone else does. I'm always looking for ways to experiment and Mm -hmm. ways to collaborate. But I'm also I'm from San Francisco and I'm very not very hippie, but like 
artsy, right? So sure. I want to yeah. bring art into what we're doing because I see a lot of people like I want to run a stream and like we're doing the thing and it's there's no craft to it, mm -hmm. right? You're like I'm just here and we have all these faces on. There's no mood. There's no mm -hmm. life. Like you had, you're playing the game, but you're doing it for yourself. You're not doing it as an experience. For yeah, as a performance for yeah. the people watching, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So that's basically what this is, and we're taking it to, we're expanding from just live stream gaming. Where um, Amy Borbel and I did like vignettes on us being different characters picking each other up at the bar. It's called dot 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 walked into a bar. <laughs> <laughs> and so those are like a short series that we did that we're going to put up hopefully soon. And then there's, um, you know, working with people on comics and mm -hmm. working with like Realmsmith on stuff and working with different people for different art platforms. Oh, that's so awesome. you're not just seeing us do one thing. You're actually witnessing us doing a whole world of things. Yeah, we've been talking about kind of branching out and doing some other things like we, we do a stream of our uh, Fit That Game. We do this show. Uh, but we've also talked about doing things like um, trying to paint miniatures on camera, and we're we're not particularly good at it, but we've we dabbled a little bit, Dustin and I in particular, and we're like, well, we know somebody who does this professionally. Maybe they can teach us, and we will suck, and it'll be funny, you know, like, and then maybe we'll get good at it over time, and people may enjoy that process. So, dude, I would love to see like like if I were to build a show, mm -hmm. what I do, I would love to see you and your dad. Mm -hmm. sit down where your dad is like teaching you painting techniques and you're doing whatever it is your dynamic because it's always a dad son <laughs> thing right true, true story yeah yeah so well, we, like, we like that, that would be interesting because it's not just about doing a thing mm -hmm. it's about what are you communicating yeah, right everything connection. you do should be dungeon mastering mm -hmm. so as a producer doing shows mm -hmm. and this is what i i feel like a lot of people don't aren't Everyone wants to be out there, but not many people are building it and shaping right. it. Um, understand what are you trying to communicate? What is your show communicating mm -hmm. to the world? What is your fit that game doing to the world? Right. Um, what is it crafting? What are you doing that's different than other people? So part of what I do on my Patreon is I do like business consulting, player consulting and dungeon masters consulting and, um, uh, uh, business slash brand but also writing consulting oh, that's so here's some free consulting like for everyone out there um know what you're trying to communicate because if you just do a thing because you're doing it mm -hmm. you're not it's not going to be interesting right so yeah. yeah that's why i say like i would love to see father son teaching thing yeah that's a really good idea i'll have to run it past him because he and i have been talking about making videos of him putting his art together in general and just like kind of talking through the process. And um, I hadn't thought about that whole dynamic of I'm trying to teach me how to do it. I'm just ready for the, uh, the Dave and Jeff uh, Orange County chopper memes. Oh no. I can start making from the, <laughs> the back and the back and forth memes. I can see that will come out of, uh, of, of Dave well, trying to teach Jeff how to sculpt. And yeah, because it's about family, right? Like mm -hmm. our whole thing. And with Gilding Light, we have a Discord. We call mm -hmm. all everyone in it. There are lights, oh, and nice. it's our safe place to be able to create and work together. Mm -hmm. But more than that, our community is so strong. The Critter community, the Light community, mm -hmm. the Twitter community in general, it's strong because we're a family. Right. And so yeah. anytime we can look, we get a window into each other's family. Mm -hmm. That's what. Um, that's that's our business essentially and it's weird to say and think that because i think a lot of people are like oh satine she's a dungeon master but i'm also a producer and i'm also a storyteller and i'm a businesswoman so it's like well but you're also a person you, get, you know and i'm also a person you yeah. know and people are culture <laughs> right and like and that's something I, I think is starting to become more coherent nowadays in this gaming culture like used to be just a bunch of isolated groups in their basement you know or whatever you want to say and now it's it's an online community that's interacting together that's um you know telling stories with one another sharing experiences uh getting into life moments you know like challenges that have come up in their life and some people sort that out in games some sometimes it's just having a space that's open and warm and inviting for a person who doesn't feel that elsewhere in their life you know 
And then sometimes it's just like we were saying before, representation matters. Sometimes it's seeing somebody like yourself out there doing something successfully and, you know, entertaining and just warm and inviting. That's, it's huge. Like, I, I never thought in my lifetime I would see Dungeons and Dragons as entertainment, right? That people tuned in to watch people playing Dungeons and Dragons. Like, it's crazy to me, you know? Funny <laughs> story. We mm-hmm. So there is a story behind all this. Mm -hmm. So nine years ago, I was running the D&D group in Hollywood, Meltdown Comic. Mm -hmm. And I I come from the Masonic fraternity uh, youth group system where I've been raising money for charities since I was 11 years old. Like Rainbow Girls? And I'd gone through... I'm a Rainbow Girl. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that. Sure. I know a little uh, thing or two. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I went through my 20s and I didn't have any charity in my life and I felt empty. Mm -hmm. You spend that long with charity, you're just, you, you know what it feels like to be of service to other people. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, I'm running two games a day or two games a week. And I had my pancake breakfast. And then all of a sudden I was like, I have, there's something missing and it's charity. So I picked a charity called Reach Out and Read. It's mm -hmm. for, to teach it's a program that gets pediatricians to teach parents the importance of reading to, or for the kids to read from the ages of six months old to 18 years old. Wow. And so we did the first one. You know, I'm in Hollywood and there's a ton of celebrities out here that play Dungeons and Dragons mm -hmm. and a lot of writers and performers. So I got four tables together. Oh, my God. And that's where <laughs> I met Matt Mercer and Jason Charles Miller and huh. uh, a ton of my other friends. And we're like, OK, we're going to do this. However, this was when Justin TV, so before Twitch, there was Justin. Um, and that was all out of, I think that started out of Meltdown Comics or ended up at Meltdown or something crazy. Really? Okay. And yeah, this, like, th this was a weird time. We were all just nerds. And uh, so we had four tables running in one location with so audio so that was in the middle. Oh my oh, God. No. And I'm like, okay. I can how only can imagine. Raise it was so nuts. Like, how do we raise money for this charity utilizing all of our friends and their followers? Because um, it was about maximizing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, well, if we have all these groups going, we put it on a web page and then put a PayPal up. Mm -hmm. Except for um, all the audio going at the same time to different feeds on the same page is nuts. <laughs> yeah, it's the yeah. worst idea I've ever had. But the next year we did it again. <laughs> And more people came out, and um, it was a little bit better, but not much. Eh. The next year, I decided we're going to do it one by one. So Matt ran his table, mm -hmm. and that was Talison and um, Talison, Marisha, Ryan was on it then, mm -hmm. um, and Michelle Morrow, I think. I, I can't oh, remember okay. exactly. Yeah, there yeah. was like a whole group, and then. Um, yeah. And the whole thing about it was Keith Baker was my partner in this, right? Oh, so he would write Eberron adventures. He made me fall in love with Eberron in 2008. The day I met him, he ran us through a game. And he was like, this is Eberron. It's, you could play a monster. And I was like, what? And we played in Droam. <laughs> it was amazing. And since then, he and I were like, we're best friends. We're going to work together. And this is the thing that we do every year together. Um, I have I've been doing so much charity for other people this year that I'm haven't uh, been able to plan it. But that's how it all started, oh, you know, wow. and then uh, the next year we did it again. And I think by that year, you know, uh, Critical Role was already doing their thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, we all kind of branched off and did it. like Ivan Van Norman was on King of the Nerds and, and uh, a bunch of people were doing other stuff in the space. And then Twitch got up and then um, Geek and Sundry went they were doing their thing mm -hmm. and then it just kind of escalated and it started off with like you know all the podcasters mm -hmm. but that was also separate from the live streamers and now you have them together yeah, and now they're doing it has been the most amazing 11 years <laughs> i i'm so lucky to have been involved in it at all and I don't think people understand where it all comes from. No, and not the a bit. fact that. No. Yeah. Because no. I see people like, we're going to make all this money. We're doing this. And I'm like, <laughs> mm -mm. dude, I did it for like, <laughs> what, seven years before I started even writing anything that got me any money. Right. And then being the community manager of Dungeons and Dragons. 
that, yeah. you don't just get that. No, that is like, huge. <laughs> like they saw that I've been, that I was doing this charity work and I've been running my own community for what, eight years before they asked me. Wow. So it's like every, I, I get a lot of weird shit, a lot of weird stuff. We started my, the web series that I was on first was mm-hmm. I hit it with my ex mm-hmm. in 2008, 2009. Mm-hmm. And that all started because of the, because I came back from Australia and was like, hey guys, to my friends, let's play D&D. And mm-hmm. my girlfriend was sick at the time and she couldn't do anything. She couldn't even play video games because her arthritis was so bad. Ooh. And so we're like, okay, we'll play D&D. And then, you know, they're models. So everything's about, you know, sure. <laughs> performing. So yeah. we're like, okay. we're good. And anyways, there is such a beautiful history that's way further back than the last couple of years that I don't think people know, but is really important to mm-hmm. where we are today. And I'm really happy to share that with people because mm-hmm. they, people do not see the craft and they don't see right. the back end and the background and where it all comes from, which is why I go to Gary Khan every year because it's a, not about what's happening. It is about what's happening now. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I've been going to Gary Khan for like the past five, six years because mm-hmm. I have a reverence of all the things that came before that make us who we are today. Yeah. Yeah, we stand on the Go backs on. of some serious yeah. giants, you know. Yeah. And it, it's only because of them that we're able to do even the little things we're able to do, you know, here and there. And, you know, and it, yeah. it does feel like even though it's been... A number of years it still feels like a new frontier at least at least from my perspective it feels like a new space because we've been kind of i think us as a group we've we've been so we've been so sheltered amongst ourselves like we we just recently last year did we start like streaming our game and before that it was we drove to our dm's house a few hours away and we sat there once a month and played in his basement you know like we 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 we, we, we were still huddled up, I think, while a lot of this was initially going on. And then we started realizing, like, man, there's this stuff got way popular while we weren't looking. You know, and so we're, we played a little catch up there at first. You know, we're, we started like, does anyone even want to watch our game? Like, we don't know. Let's just start streaming it and see what happens. Like, you know, and yeah, realize, exactly. like, there is more audience out there than what you initially think. You just have to figure out how to find it and grab it. Yeah. yeah and like you've been saying, you have to have something worth watching. And, you know, it's, it's a learning curve. Like, I, I know just doing this show and doing our fit that thing, there's a lot more like you were describing behind the scenes than meets the eye. And like, there's a lot in the production side of things. Sure. There's a lot of like last minute things, you know, dealing with the little logistic hiccups here and there. And, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of thinking about, you know, how to incorporate, you know, the audience, how much to acknowledge them, what sorts of influence they should or shouldn't have on the, the show that you're doing. There's just a lot of things to consider. And until you start doing it, you just don't see that, you know, and it's, it's easy to overlook, but absolutely. But I think, you know, like the work that you guys have been doing and just the, the sheer joy it's created for so many people has to be just tremendously rewarding, you know, like, dude, Oh, humble city. Like, (laughs) you know, so one of, one of the things after I left D and D my whole purpose in life is to connect the global community Mm -hmm. because I I go to these different countries and I talk to people and everyone still feels alone. Yeah. The country feels separate from other countries. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, you guys have no idea that you're the same as all the other countries. You just call your food different things. Mm -hmm. Everybody eats pizza. Everybody eats uh, uh, French fries or chips or crisps or cookies. Like it's all the same and they play the same too. Really? They just have slightly different shades because of whatever their culture emphasizes. Say, thought there would be a little culture emphasis. Yeah. Just a little bit. Huh. Like uh, the French are a little more intellectual mm-hmm. when they, in their gameplay, a little more heady. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Spain, that, that one, well, that was a very mixed one. Um, Milan, they, they treat it like soccer. They're no. <laughs> gung ho about it like it's beautiful but they all have characters and they, all their characters have flaws and they all role play to overcome things and mm-hmm. kill things and negotiate so um, there are a lot of really cool international D&D shows and mm-hmm. trying to um, there was actually a different point of what I was saying now, now I'm going on a tangent hey tangents but, are good that's what this show is all yeah. about you just, you just <laughs> go wherever you want to go we'll follow don't worry <laughs> 
Okay, cool. Improv is um, a skill. My whole point is to show, right? So mm-hmm. I do a European tour. Mm-hmm. And uh, this year, TJ Storm and I went on a European tour of Milan, Barcelona, Paris, and then London. And then we did D&D in the castle, which was amazing. Yeah, it sounds like a tough um, job. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it was, oh. But Man. it was really beautiful. Like, I, I, it's so important to me to bring everyone together. Like, mm-hmm. I don't want people to feel alone. You well, know, like I used to feel alone. Mm-hmm. And now that I've found now that I have found Dungeons and Dragons, I will be its evangelist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think that's a paradox of today's technology, right? Like when we were kids in the 80s, like the world was really small, you know, at least for us, you know, you knew who you knew and that was about it, you know. But then now that we have the Internet, there's this connection sort of to everyone you know you're 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 only a few clicks away from interacting with another person but it's a different type of interaction it's not that same intimacy and i think it's it's very easy to see this giant pool of people and feel like you're not part of it even though it's there you know i'm wondering if that's a new thing so that's the thing so in each of these countries in each of these cities i throw an event Mm -hmm. And the event's purpose is to, I do a panel with whoever the experts are in that community. Mm -hmm. And then I invite everybody, all the podcasters, all the Twitch streamers, all the gamers, all the leaders of the community, anyone who's interested in meeting other people. Mm -hmm. And I bring them all to one place. It's almost like a mini convention. And we spend a whole afternoon together. We play games or we just do the talk or whatever. And at the end, we do signings. And then at the very end, we all go out and eat. Nice. And it is the coolest thing and i've i've you know the london event last year Mm -hmm. was so cool and then the london event this year was even bigger and some of those people came back and over the last over the last year i'm watching the people work starting to work together oh now they're doing podcasts together and now there's like there's one podcast by guy sklanders who does uh, how to be a great gm Mm -hmm. i don't know if if you you should definitely watch definitely check it out brilliant oh he's so wonderful but there's people on it from all over the world, right? And it's just magnificent. So this year was kind of dabbing, dabbling in there um, into the different countries and getting people to like wake up. Mm-hmm. It's about waking up and mm-hmm. saying, oh, look at all these people. Next year, I'm going on a bigger European tour for more cities and more countries. And wow. um, basically being the Pied Piper of community so that people can have access to one another because you know in hollywood we had and it's really weird now because meltdown's not there and we don't have Mm -hmm. a centralized hub to go to but um having that is so important the physical space is important yeah yeah as opposed to online well because like you you need one place to at least have a centralized Mm -hmm. something right you Mm -hmm. need something but then you, from there, you can, you know, play virtually if you'd like. Right. But yeah. it's about being able to meet people and going, oh, hi, mm-hmm. you are a person and you're real because that is what D and D is about, right? Mm-hmm. The connection, the community, the cooperation, and so even if they only meet once a year, it's important that they do. Yeah. And that's why all of oh, us yeah. going to all these conventions is really important. Mm-hmm. You know, some people go to too many conventions <laughs> or maybe I don't go to enough. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you know, if it's what you love, it's it never enough, right? You can always have more. Well, they understand that. Me and my online guild, we're doing that this weekend. We're heading to Philadelphia this weekend for our annual guild cookout. So we, nice. I definitely can relate to that because we, we would do that every year. So uh, and there's plenty of them there, you know, in chat. It looks like uh, chat head ups. Awesome. Shout out to them, God, I wish I could see the chat right now. It's driving me crazy looking at the OBS on the side. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, cover, I'm, I'm covering the chat here. I got That's it. Good. It's we good. Do How you doing, chat? More questions coming up. Do we have more questions? We do. We actually have a few more questions that have come in here. Um, well, let's slip them in there. One from a from a guild mate of mine, actually. Um, this is from Zalen from CU Smart Gamer. He says, um, this is more related, I guess, to your art. What was an experience where you learned that language and art had power? Oh, good question. So growing up, I went through really bad childhood trauma. So it was like nine years of sexual abuse, right? And so I was an artist since I was teensy, teensy bitty. 
And I found that I, I, I didn't have a voice. Mm-hmm. So um, my art was how I communicated. And so even in relationships, I would, I couldn't vocalize if something bad was happening, I was getting manipulated or whatever, and I would draw it out. Mm. And then I would post it back on like live journal. <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember live. Journal. I do remember live journal. Oh, yes. <laughs> I remember the live journal. Yeah. Or my space. And I'd post it and people would see it. Mm. They would interpret it. But a lot of times they knew what I was talking about without me even saying anything. Yeah. And then there was a connection of, Oh God, I, I know what you're feeling. And that all the, any heartbreak I went through, you know, I would like draw this girl tearing her heart out of her chest and just crying into her hands and, People are like, I was there. I would. I, mm-hmm. That's me too. Um, so I've always known that art is powerful. And mm-hmm. now I think my I don't draw much anymore, but I do find the art of existing is who I am, mm. and being honest and truthful is like honest. I think that is the big thing. And if you're yeah. honest, you can com- you can connect with people more and that's what art is is communicating it really right? is if yeah. you're a successful artist then you then you have communicated in the most simple form <laughs> I, it, it takes a lot of bravery to come out and and show other people your experience you know like it, it's very easy to get in the you know get in that place where you want to just kind of collapse in and stay silent and not tell your story you know yeah, because I mean, I'm right now in a place where I can tell my childhood story, mm-hmm. but I cannot tell my adult story yet. There yeah. are things that I will tell eventually, maybe one day, that of uh, emotional abuse and all this other stuff. But I, mm-hmm. you can only be so brave, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, sure, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, and, and it also, I mean, I, I guess as like a public person as well, that's it's a, another mm-hmm. layer to that, right? You know, maybe that's something you can express to like a, a close friend or something in private. But like yeah. once you're, I mean, you, you've kind of achieved celebrity status here, not kind of, you have. And like as a result, yeah, sure. you know, like it, there's a bigger impact, you know, in terms of more people hearing your stories and understanding you and seeing themselves reflected in your, your life. And um, yeah, you know. for instance, I can say that my dad is a terrible person and everyone knows why but i can't if somebody makes me upset or somebody does something to me i have to be really careful like i can't just say that out loud right because maybe i'm mad at the time but over time i almost always forgive everybody Mm -hmm. but if i say it out loud i know the internet will come to my aid yeah and i don't want to cry wolf you know and i i want to i don't want to hurt anybody so it's I'm I try to be really careful on what I say online mm-hmm. about anybody. Yeah, because it's dangerous. Oh, yeah. It, it yeah, it, it's power yeah. that like I mean I just I don't take any of this for granted. Also, I know it could all fall apart. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Right. Like, yeah. So I don't want to manipulate anything, and I don't want to take advantage of anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. No, that's yeah. It wow. It is. There's so much to unpack in in this topic, right? It's like yeah. trying to trying to decide how how deep I want to get into the conversation. Um, but I, I think I go with, all the way. Yeah, so yeah, I could. I go all I could. the way. Home base, so. <laughs> uh, but this seems like it's touching back into into your your businesses as well, because as you described before, it's important for you to create a space uh, for people to come in together and to share and to to see one another. Um, you know, and with the description of the artwork before, obviously that ties in very, very tightly to that concept. Uh, have, have there been any moments specific in a game setting where you felt like there was a particular therapeutic benefit as a tool? So I'm writing a book about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so my book is about how um, D&D has helped me through my childhood trauma mm-hmm. and to help heal me from PTSD, mm-hmm. right? So my childhood trauma started the same year I found Dungeons and Dragons. What wow. I didn't realize was I was making a character and fighting these monsters, mm-hmm. but really I was fighting him, but I couldn't fight him. I was just eight years old, right? Yeah. Just a little girl. But 
you know, I had that split life where I had the terrible reality and then I got to escape into this other reality and I was smart and I was fast mm -hmm. and I was um, strong. And I think I was, uh, Vlania started off as a thief mage. Mm -hmm. Now she's a, a bard wizard. <laughs> but back then it was a, th a thief and a mage because that was a long time ago. Yeah, because that, that's what um, the classes were then. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those are always the classes I gravitated towards too. I don't know if that's just like yeah, a Yeah, right. A kid oh yeah, I thing totally multi class. And back then that was death. <laughs> yeah. Because you're never gonna level. <laughs> <laughs> never. <laughs> never. So, you know, I made this character and then that's my book is a, a workbook. It's an mm -hmm. autobiography and it's also a workbook on how to overcome whether you're going through it because that's mm -hmm. so important. People are like, Oh, this is just for when you're when you're out of it no this is like if you're going through it here's a thread mm -hmm. please take this thread and find strength within here yeah and then after that you know i realized i could level up in real life so i was a straight a student mm -hmm. you know high intelligence i was in uh, taekwondo mm -hmm. and really good at that so high decks and um i was in theater so i started getting better charisma Mm -hmm. So it was just like, oh, I could do this and I could just keep going. And then I started dealing with all of it. Right? Yeah. And then through my research of how to heal from PTSD is about belonging to a group and belonging to um, and being able to do things and make more memories that overtake all the bad memories. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's nine years of mem bad memories. Yeah, but because right, yeah. I've been so ingrained in D and D for the last twelve years, it's like I've now, like, in one session, I could have an entire year's worth of of memories. Yeah, with my friends, and we cooperated, right. and we overcame, and we defeated, and we laughed. I got my arm chopped off, or whatever, you know. So the power of play is so important for so many levels. So. I've been uh, interviewing a lot of different psychologists and experts, and I'm friends with Dr. B, mm -hmm. and he does take this, and his whole their whole thing is to help people uh, with D and D be a part of like learn skills to mm -hmm. cope with being a human being, like recognizing like if you have. Uh, I, words 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 um not uh asperger's but um autism autism yeah, yeah. Oh, right? yeah it's autism, yes. so yeah so mm -hmm. how to practice all of these skills so that in the real world you can you can be you yeah. and interact with people so there's that and i um there's this other guy goblin oh man i just talked to him the other day i met him in london and he works with um kids that that are like uh, from africa okay right um afro cuban mm -hmm. descent that you know they don't know anything about D, &D. right and yeah. i gotta find this actually i i do need to find this because he is so beautiful like i i had this long talk with him the other day and he just swept me off my feet with what he's doing the goblin's chest the i goblin's think it's the goblin's chest. Chest .com. yeah cubans represent so, by the way <laughs> yeah. My half Cuban size getting proud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, man. Yeah, so I got to I have to find this these notes because he like I said, okay. So it was actually um Afro Caribbean mixed race. Mm -hmm. Um and he works with kids with PTSD and severe trauma from South Africa. Man. Yeah just blew me away with what he's doing i mean you have all these people all around the world dr megan connell she helps uh girls be through role playing mm -hmm. right she was like you can be a superhero yeah and she does a show called clinical role <laughs> and she actually does a bunch of other uh, interviews with people like there's so much now people are doing so much with D, &D to help either people learn how to function in reality and mm -hmm. have like and learn how to be social 
right? There's a because tremendous number is, of skills. It can be practice. Oh, and, so oh, much. Absolutely. And I saw Kickstarter the other day. Um, a friend of ours of the show here, uh, Leopold the Just, was helping promote where they're using it in prisons. Yes. Yeah. Try yeah. To help people in prisons yeah. now too. So Which, by the way, everybody, that one's coming DVD close to everywhere. the end days like who would i would have never imagined when i started back in high school like 20 some years ago that they'd be using D for all these other things right like it was that thing that we did that we didn't tell anybody about mm. well we didn't <laughs> know what we were doing it for right yeah. and um a lot of us were nerds and mm. it was our escapism it was our way to take control of a situation yep it was our way to, of learning of getting away from the bad things and, and kind of like turning your world in on yourself so that you're but doing it with people that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. It was an art form, you know. Uh, if you're if you're an artist, usually you're you're drawing it out. If you're a writer, you're taking notes and you're elaborating on it. And you have like, all of a sudden, you have novels. You know, like it's it is profound, and I am so blessed to have. I I'm, I'm so happy that there are a lot of new people mm -hmm. that are playing D and D. But I'm so blessed to have been playing it for so long and just watching it over time yeah, watch and it wise enough to reflect on the different eras of my life and how important it was to those different time frames. In the way that it was oh. as well. So yeah. as I think as the game has evolved, it's been different things for me at different points in my yeah. life, you know. Um, you know, and it's interesting because it it's not an in trying to think out of phrases it's it's not super uncommon to hear that gamers have depression social anxiety uh difficult home lives you know these things and it's almost there, there's some component of gaming that seems to really reach out and appeal to people that are going through that and i'm not saying that all gamers have these experiences but yeah. it seems like it's disproportionately high and, it, and it's, yeah, I, agree there. I would definitely say that just the innate qualities of gaming are therapeutic, you know, and I'm, I'm glad to see that that's actually being officially dug into, you know, as opposed to just kind of like a few people on the fringes talking about it, you know, but yeah, it's, it's, it's well, a big thing. It's not just that, but it's about how successful it actually is when you do apply it. Yeah. Like that's, that's the thing. Like this wouldn't be getting the kind of traction it's getting in all these different areas and used in all these different ways after school programs all these things you see mm -hmm. popping up all over the place now if it wasn't working mm -hmm. like if you were doing yeah. it and it wasn't working they would have thrown it out by now and been like give them back to the nerds go back to your basements this stuff is not clearly doing what you guys said it would do and but no it, it works for people yeah and it's really beautiful because you know you have all these video games you have lots of movies and you have cartoons and role-playing games and of course, our community is going to be so overly thoughtful that we're like, but why are we playing? Let's research this. But right. what does the effect have on people? Let's research this. Like, mm -hmm. we are very lucky because now there are so many people doing the research. Mm -hmm. It's so often in life, people are wander through and everyone, people have an effect on each other. Mm -hmm. uh, parents have an effect on their kids. Grandparents have an effect on the kids. Um, but we are very nonchalant about, you know, a lot of us are very me, me, me. Mm -hmm. We're nonchalant about the effect we have on people. I don't think people know the power they have when they when we meet, right? Mm -hmm. I did a signing and I'm talking with people and I'm shaking their hands and they're like, this means so much to me. And I'm like, oh, so much to me. Like, you don't know what this connection means. And I know you, I recognize you. I, I went to your website. I listened to you mm -hmm. and every person I meet is a connection. And I like, if people realize that every single interaction makes a difference in each other's lives, mm -hmm. I think the world would be a different place for certain. Um, but we are lucky that we ask those questions. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's a, it's a time where people are forced to, or not forced to, they, they want to, and they get the opportunity to sit down and slow down and to mm -hmm. just be with a person. Like we're having this conversation now where we've had a couple hours of just sitting here and just talking, you know, and yeah. this 
it's, it shouldn't be a rarity, but it is in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, like you go to work, you get up, you know, you're tired. Oh, God, I got to get in the car, you know, drive off to work. You go do your job, hopefully enjoy some part of it. Yeah. And then, you know, you come home and then you're like, oh, now I'm tired. I don't want to go do anything, you know. Well, it's it's <laughs> easy to be disconnected. So much, so much of what is considered everyday conversation now happens with your thumbs on your yeah. phone. True. Typing out I letters don't. And, the, and you don't yeah, ever face-to-face -face talk. Um, I specifically don't have, I don't have full conversations with people. And I, I have a hard time talking on the phone with people. Mm. For me, I try to, if, and even through email, it's like, let's schedule a time to talk via, via um, Zoom or whatever. Yeah, the because... nonverbal is really important. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I just, I don't want to get stuck in these, like, not like these superficial threads. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so easy to just, like, I'm having a conversation with you and five other people at the same time. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, how many people can actually concentrate on a conversation? Mm -hmm. And that's how things get misinterpreted because you accidentally said the wrong thing or your auto spell thing <laughs> put the wrong the word in. That's why we know yeah. that yeah, elves and pixies are real because there's one living in those phones. <laughs> I know. <laughs> a little gremlin just cursing us every day. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do spend a lot of time alone and I get a lot of alone time because of that. Yeah. Um, in most interaction that I do get, like I barely text my friends. Sorry, guys. Um, I spend the most time on my Discord channel, mm -hmm. um, in my Patreon channel. Um, so Gilding Light has a Discord. I love them so much. I'm definitely gonna be checking that out. Yeah, we'll after this, have to find like, a great place. Okay, imagine a place where you're just having the worst day, or even like a kind of bummed out day, and you're like, you love, because sometimes we're all babies inside, right? Like you just need love. Hold, I want to want to hug and maybe some face kisses mm -hmm. and you're not going to say that to your friends but in gilding light like you can go to the general chat and be like hey guys i'm having a hard day can i have a brain hug and all of a sudden everyone will come out and be like hugs memes it's like it's the super most safe space it's my safe space on the internet mm -hmm. so i spend awesome. most of my time on discord and the other parts of my time on twitter and uh instagram because I, yeah yeah because it. it's more active like it I don't know, really I, is I just feel like, well and yeah. it, it's something you've created right yeah. like that's something we're, we're kind of experiencing slowly here but i mean I, not too slowly it actually feels like it's happening really quickly but with uh with our own channel on discord you know we're coming in contact with so many other content creators you know other shows other artists you know people writing you know coming together and they're excited about what they have to offer and they're sharing that stuff other people are getting excited about what they're doing you know we're going on we're watching their shows they're watching our shows you know we're cross promoting like crazy and it, it feels like a real community you know i get on the channel and i'm like oh man I, i'm pumped for what those guys are doing like you know these ladies over here are doing some awesome stuff doing that you know and like i want to see these guys succeed and it, it's I don't get enough of that in my life, you know, <laughs> but now I'm starting to yeah. see it here and it's, it's Yay. quickly happening and it's beautiful, yep. you know? Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Finding well, your tribe you. is so important. Today I got a new, I just got new things. I got a new gilding light. Oh, hat. nice. Ooh. Look at that. I designed that. This is the golden, golden ratio. ratio yeah. Artist, you know that yeah. is, and it's oh, the yeah. dice, but the hat came out a little funny because it all, like it's supposed to, it's just, the dice mm -hmm. but it's like you can see the back of the dice yep so oh, but yeah, they okay. make all the same lines so mm -hmm. it just looks like a mess <laughs> but i got this and i was like uh hey guys what do you think and then i tried on the leggings and i was like oh, i'm having this conversation with them i got a cool shirt and i showed what do you think about this and basically like i i wouldn't make it available to the public unless they approved it oh yeah yeah That's you know so, so cool. having like being able to have feedback from them and like mm -hmm. talk to them about things is so important. That's oh, a good looks super cute. I like it. Yeah. Looks nice. Yeah, that is a nice. Hat. <laughs> yeah, and then I made one that's sirens in the sirens font, oh, but cool. it's black on black. And then it has. Oh, does this have the like, gilding light on the side? I don't see yeah. it. Yeah, I don't see one. Oh, oh there it is. Oh, it is. It's just in the black. Oh, black on black. <laughs> see, I could see black <laughs> on black as a colorblind man, but you know, some other colors don't work out so well for me. But that one, I could see it. 
colorblind? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not just He's one type of colorblind. Do you have blind. the glasses? No. <laughs> I have two types. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I, I don't. They're a little bit on my price range. But, uh, yeah, there, I have two oh, yeah, types of colorblindness. So I'm like severely one type and then moderately a second type. And there's a third type that I'm not that type of colorblind. So two out of three ain't bad. But, you know. <laughs> It, it, I want to know what the world looks like from your face. <laughs> every, every chance we get, we mark things green and red just so Jeff can't tell. What that see, yeah, my dice bag's for, not here, but somebody... That's, that's, how you, that's what you do with your friends, right? You find those little things, and then you have, make sure you have fun with them every chance you get. You know, so you, you have can't cool see screens. green or red, but then there's another one, right? Like blue and purple? So it, blue and my blue color blindness and... is extra weird. So like one of them is that brown and... I'm trying to remember how this goes. It's red looks more green and brown, but then brown looks more red and yellow. And then there's another weird skew. So it's not even like the same direction. It's like things are just muted and muddy and just weird. Oh my God. Yeah. I want to see you paint so bad. <laughs> I, I Well, and that's the thing. What's interesting is like, this is a weird conversation, I guess, for what we're talking about, but, um, but the, the color vision and perception of reality is just based on your experience, right? So, like, I mean, that's green, you know? Like, why? Because you told me that's green. Like, I've looked at it now in that that's context, true. I see it as green. Like, I'm assuming underside of your bill is green, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, it's, it is. So, like, there are certain things I look at and I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. I could tell what that is. And other times when colors are near each other, like, for instance, uh, the one that really trips me out is... Like say like you have a blue map and you have red lettering on it, which seems to be really prevalent. I don't know why. That will do all kinds of weird depth problems. It'll like jump in and out randomly. Oh, what does this look like to you? I mean, it looks like rainbowy purple, like pink to purple kind of color. But <laughs> so like you, people do this all the time. They're like, oh, what is this color? What is this? Color? I'm like, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this. You're like asshole. That's <laughs> the color that you picked. But uh, it just looks different. <laughs> yeah, but but I do think it has some effects because like, you know, people love the fall. I look at the fall and I'm like, I don't understand it, guys. It's just brown and gray. Oh. Like this is this is a horrible time of the year. <laughs> because color is evocative of yeah. you know, em evokes emotion. Mm -hmm. So wow. Yeah. All the descriptions what? are that yeah, these bro. two types of color blindness, everything looks dull, basically dreary and dark. So Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> wow, we just learned something cool. Oh yeah, yeah. But you know, I've learned so a lot of colors. I especially want to. I, yeah, like, well, that's the thing, right? Like, now I really want to extra see you paint and from like pick the colors that you choose. Yeah, well, if you want to, really you want to show me how to paint, and uh, you want to make that a thing, we'll do it. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. It'll, it'll be do it. black and white with like one other color. He can actually tell what it is. That's let's see, black, I white, and red. <laughs> I have a feeling it's going to be more interesting than that. Could be. Could be. Because also, I want to like I would. Add, I'm always done to mastering. I would like to see what affects you emotionally. Mm. Like what colors that you're just like. Oh. Mm -hmm. that, I mean. But I'm all feely. I'm a touchy feely person. If I see a color, if I see a, a like fire, it just makes my breath. It takes my breath away. Mm. Or just a certain color combination, like my hair. I'm just like, oh, yeah. I can feel it. You know. Well, so and I, I want to see what colors make you take your breath away. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is like color blindness is part of why I'm really fascinated by like psychology in general and like people's perception in general. And uh, I know we're getting close to the time here, and I'm going to yep. run way over time here on accident. But um, and we started a little late, so we were yeah, we right. started we late. a little. Yeah, yeah. And my game, my my home games, like they're, I'm sure they're about to shut down, so I got time. Oh, okay. Um, That's excellent. But I'm fascinated by it, you know, in terms of perception uh, with color and all that kind of stuff. And um, it, it, I have totally lost my train of thought with that little derailment. Oh, I'm sorry. Wow, how did I do that to myself? Oh, uh, psychology yep. influencing. Well, you were yeah. talking about when we were chatting before the show uh, about visualization and having that and then losing it and then having it um, kind of come back. Um, I don't have that. Like I've described, you know, people describe, you know, like, oh, when I close my eyes, I can imagine shapes. And I'm like, 
I know that there's a shape there. I can tell you all about it. I don't see it though. So I like, used to, so after I got in the car accident that happened mm -hmm. to me for six months, I had no imagination. None. How do you? None. I I would close my eyes. It was a black void. That was it. Yeah. I mean, is that what you? Is that yours? Essentially, like if somebody says, you know, imagine a wireframe yellow box, right? Yeah. If I concentrate with like every ounce of power I have, I will see a black on black kind of edge that might be a corner if I'm looking at that one specifically. And then if I look anywhere else, it's gone. But I could wow. tell you like where it is. I could tell you what its shape is supposed to be, its dimensions. I could tell you what its color is supposed to be. I could tell you everything about it. I can manipulate it in my mind. I just don't see it. It's like touch almost like that's crazy. Yeah. And, but I describe this to people and people are like, really? And I'm like, you guys actually see stuff like, oh, yeah. Same thing yeah, with yeah, dreams. Right. Like I'll dream, I but I don't see anything, but I know what I'm looking at. I don't dream cause I don't sleep. It was like, it freaked me out. Yeah. Like <clears throat> getting in that car accident was more than just, I got hurt. It was, mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine. Here's somebody like I'm a 3D sculptor, right? So yeah. I did a lot of 3D sculpting and, and normal sculpting. I you close your eyes, you visualize it, and you make it, and you're like, oh, uh, I need to like if you're illustrating something, I can see it, I could turn it around, and then I could draw it. Yeah. In my mind's eye, turn it and draw it. I and then I couldn't see anything in my brain, and I was like, how do you create? How do you create? Like. Oh, I have so many questions for you. Maybe that, we could talk about this another absolutely. time. Absolutely. I would love to. I have so many questions on like perception and how you experience things because mm -hmm. like I feel like we all have the same like we all have the same drive, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a gamer, you're a dungeon master, you have the same drive, but it's almost like if you have a handicap in one area, you find another way to mm -hmm. do the same thing that you would do. Well, like I'm a massage therapist, so like apparently my sense of touch is crazy good but my apparently my perception is terrible <laughs> in a different way so it's uh yeah it's fascinating you know and and, and creativity wise like i found I, I try to be into art when i was a kid but you know like you develop your your critiquing skills much faster than your artistic skills when your dad's an artist uh, but i found like <laughs> things like carving worked for me because i was revealing a shape like i couldn't see what i was gonna make but as it started to look like something, then I can kind of start to see the rest of it, but only because it was revealing itself. Whereas when I was drawing, like if I was looking at an object, I could kind of draw it. But if I was trying to imagine it, it was just like, I might as well just be scribbling random things and hope that there's a shape wow. that happens in there. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Do we have any other Same. questions before I monopolize yeah, all we, the time? We got, on this? A, we got a few, <laughs> but there, we, we've wandered uh, away from a lot of the topics that uh, we had some questions coming up here. That's about. okay. We could jump right we in. We could jump right back a, in my, here. I've got we, my digression hat on. That's a nice hat. We got, we got one coming in here. Uh, ink, ink and ignorance again. It says, um, is, there, is there any tips for running Tomb of Horrors? He's oh, getting geez. ready to start running Tomb of Horrors soon. He wants to do it justice. Have you, or do you have any experience with Tumo? Yeah, dude. Uh, <laughs> like that is what we've all been telling him for a week now since he's decided he was going to do this. We're like, yeah, are you sure? Well, I mean, run it, but don't run it with play it with characters that people love because yeah. everyone's going to die. <laughs> yeah, Which can be with. fun too, right? It's like how yeah. far can you get? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of those crawls that's very much a like climbing Mount Everest sort of thing. Like you mm -hmm. get to the end of it, you're like, I made it through Tomb of Horrors. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. Can you made it in, but can you get out? <laughs> right? Endurance trial horror. activated. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um he also wants to know if you have a favorite DM that people may not know about. Oh. Mm. Well, I may be a little biased, but TJ Storm is amazing um i don't know if you've seen him on mm -hmm. uh it's uh oh i can't remember that now it's fables fables and oh, sorry tj i'm the worst <laughs> uh, so, That's all right. i'm sure people uh, yeah find their, they start googling i'm sure they'll find them and then uh 
fables, fables and legends. That sounds. I like now I I do so many things. <laughs> Monsters and fables. Monsters and fables. Monsters and fables. fables. Yeah, uh, the cast is amazing, and he is. So TJ is Godzilla and Iron Man and Predator and the new Darth Vader in the video games. So oh. he's a voice actor. Gotcha. He's wow. A okay. Okay. On uh, League of Legends, and he's on like Call of Duty and all those other things. Man. Oh, that's so cool. imagine, <laughs> right? Yeah, he just is like, like the other day I got back from something and I just sat uh, drawing while his his running his campaign mm -hmm. i was like sitting in the middle of the group just doing the thing and he he's just walking around he gets up and he's doing this like thing and he does all the different voices for the different characters and he's got music going and he's got like art on the big tv so that you could see what's going on and i'm like i wish i was as cool as today <laughs> <laughs> it's all inspiration though right that's the beautiful thing of watching other people just yeah. really just knock it out of the park. You look at it and you go, man, I wish I could do I can do that. I just got to practice, you know? Yeah, I mean, that was a cool thing. So, you know, we in the different countries, I would watch him uh, learn. Like, we would learn the language because I have a whole thing where I could speak. I could be in a culture that fast. There's 10 words that you learn. And you can get your get around and then all of a sudden talk in the accent oh, wow. and kind of get the feel. And so he and I would do that. We, like, we were on the plane. We learned the 10 words. We land. And we just started doing that. And then he was like just watching the way he would practice the words. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, that's how you do it. And then he would explain how like this culture, like they speak it from this part of the yeah, throat. Yeah, the back of the throat. Or the front, this part of the mouth. The neck. Yeah. yeah, so I'm like, wow. And so I got to learn a little bit about that from him. I, I was, was cool. trying to figure that out the other day, actually, because we, we had a whole segment about trying to voice act, right? And so we did a bunch of goofy voices and had a good time with it. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, but one of the things was I could not, for the life of me, come up with a Scottish or an Irish accent. And I was like, I don't understand what the problem is. And then the other day, you know, in the shower where you do all these sorts of things, it worked and i was like whoa that is a really strange mouth feel like yeah i had to flip like, where my voice normally comes from and then all of a sudden it just worked and i was like oh <laughs> this is how they yeah, talk <laughs> so if you have like usually you have a word mm -hmm. or a phrase that you say that kicks it into gear yep. like yep. for mm -hmm. never winter they wanted me to do an african accent Mm -hmm. which has always been the scariest accent for me since I was in theater in high school. I could not do it at all. But I was like, Wakanda forever. And then all of a sudden I can like, <laughs> drop into it because like that was just the perfect one. And then I went to Seattle recently to do a voiceover and it was Russian. And I was like, yep. gosh, that's the other one that I just can't oh, do. See, I, and I, I just studied it. There's a website. It's called Idea. Mm -hmm. And it's, it has different dialects from all over the world. But it also has different dialects from people from different classes, mm -hmm. from different age ranges. So if you live, if you're like a school teacher or if you're a bureaucrat, like mm -hmm. these are the different, um, oh, cool. this is how these people talk. And yeah. if you're in the, from this part of the city or if you're from this part of the city. How do you talk? That's actually, so that's I think, cool. the site I went to when I was developing my LARP character's voice, who was Russian. Yeah, so, uh, idea. I spent a oh, lot cool. of time with these little videos, and they would be like, okay, and this is how you say this. And when they're talking like this, this is how they do it. And it's part this of your mouth. And you remember any sound like this, drop it and do this. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> that makes yeah. sense. I could do that. <laughs> We got crazy icon point today with the links. Everything you guys are talking about, he's finding the links and dropping them in the chat. For oh, everyone. good so to he's, see he's, he's there. Windows update is finally Windows finished. Windows update completed. He is <laughs> dropping links in the chat for Welcome us now. Back. <laughs> Thank you, Clint. Awesome. Holding it. Do we have any other questions that we've uh, missed? Uh, yeah, kind of. Really, only kind of one left here, um, and that was uh, how did she get involved with Court of the Dead? Hmm. <laughs> Um, Todd, uh, Tom Gilliland is a gamer and also is like 
the those guys are friends with friends of mine and they were looking to do a thing and it was like this thing and I just stopped working for D D. It was like this weird cosmos thing mm-hmm. that was just like right place, right time. And yeah, so now I'm I'm running a bunch of shows over at Sideshow Collectibles. Man. No, wait, I it's don't all know networking. What to talk about. There's some cool <laughs> things coming out that will be really good for you folks who are watching. I don't know if they can talk about it. I know, I think that we did talk about it in one of the shows where they have a bunch of different games mm-hmm. being released at the end of the year into next year. One's a card game, one's a board game, and one's a different type of game. Different kind of game. Hmm. Ooh. Hmm, eyebrow wiggling kind of game. That's all I can say about that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so um, hopefully by the end of the year we'll have another shotgun. I don't know, I can't let it say anything. (laughs) But I love it. It's like, you know, the underworld, and it's this, it's a place where they are like, we're an adult brand, Mm -hmm. and we love all of Satine. Mm -hmm. And we want Satine to be all of Satine in her sexiness and her darkness and mm-hmm. i'm like thank you <laughs> <laughs> so i get to you know i've been working for hasbro for so long mm-hmm. that i'm yeah. really happy to be like oh i'm also an adult <laughs> <laughs> so i want to be an adult as well as you know an advocate for kids absolutely yeah. it's it's, yeah. it's it's a tough path to navigate but there's no reason why they shouldn't work together you know well, I do like keeping it separate. So I've got yeah. a show called The Storyteller's Guide, which I don't know if you guys have seen it. I have, but I have seen yeah. that. Yes. It's good Thanks. stuff. <laughs> so um, GM Tips on Geek and Sundry mm-hmm. is Geek and Sundry. So mm-hmm. that was theirs. On Dungeons and Dragons, I had a show called The Dungeon Master's Guide. Mm-hmm. But technically it's theirs. So part of Gilding Light is me finally owning my own content. Mm-hmm. So, oh, that's uh, awesome. Yeah. So The Storyteller's feeling. Guide... It really is beautiful. It's sponsored by World Anvil and Idol Champions, hmm. and it talks about storytelling, right? So mm-hmm. it's more than just being a gamer, which this is why I love World Anvil, is because yeah. it, it's for, for both. So we, it's like G, there's 10 minutes of GM tips where mm-hmm. I kind of spout my tips as a cartoon character. Nice. As my little cartoon character from Idol Champions. Mm. And then 45 minutes of me and two game masters well me like navigating them through an adventure creation process and showing people of all ages how easy it is because like accessibility right like it's so important for people to realize it's not as daunting as they think it is Mm -hmm. and it's as easy as a bunch of ideas that you make up and then after that you can elaborate on it but it's super easy is this what I saw the other so, day on Facebook? You were doing a, a live stream of like yeah. uh, talking back and forth with people, and you're just basically like, oh, and then so and so shows. Because actually, I think Jason Carl yeah, was you on were there. Great. Thanks yeah. for hanging out with me oh. in the chat. Yeah, well, thank you for <laughs> noticing. No. Um, but yeah, yeah we, we you were talking a lot about just like throwing an idea out, and then everyone involved would kind of like chime in with, oh, and then they have this job, and this is their motivation, and then why? Well, why would they be here? It's weird, you know. Oh, well, it's because of this, you know, and then that collaborative process was just really cool to watch. Is that something you're going to do more of yeah. that like specific thing? Yeah. So we, we have six episodes out now and this mm-hmm. season is going to be 12 episodes oh, nice. and we have two different game masters for the first one, but this, this last, so we recorded in April and May or May and June. Mm-hmm. And then we took the summer off and then September we filmed the next four and we're, I'm taking it out of just Game Masters to all my writer friends <laughs> and um, artist friends in Los Angeles. Awesome. So um, hopefully I can get my friends. Uh, I want to get Kirk Thatcher on who works for the Henson Company and mm-hmm. works for all sorts of stuff. Uh, Steven Glickman. I don't know if you know him. He's a comedian. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Sounds familiar. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just other people who are storytellers and, and less focused on Game. Well, it is. It's all making an adventure you can play because right. eventually I want to be able to put them on the DMs Guild for people to have for free, gotcha. and then they can okay. come up with their own ideas. And mm-hmm. I want people in the Discord to like tell us what they were inspired by. Like, you heard all this. What adventure did you create based on these prompts? I'm wow. very proud of it. It's my baby. Aside from Sirens, which is also my baby, which will be back in sep- late September, maybe early October. 
Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, oh, that looks great. I really enjoy that stuff. It's it's a lot of fun to do. It's a lot of fun to just develop that as a skill set. And it just, it's a good exercise, really. I mean, a lot of people that get into gaming don't realize how much of the art of being a storyteller is just making the illusion of a fleshed out world out of very specific yep. small pieces, you know, can I just keep this thing together? And why did, why did I make that decision? Well, let's come up with a reason for that. Okay. And what, what are the players really latching onto? Well, this detail. Okay. Well, that needs to become really important. So now what am I doing? You know, and, but also talking with other game masters and storytellers, mm -hmm. cause you know, we're all like, I'm, I'm, this is my opus and I don't want yeah. anyone to steal my ideas. Well, let me tell you something. All ideas have been done. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it, you know, the more you can play with your friends, your peers, right? Because mm -hmm. your dungeon master peers, and you can bounce ideas off of them. So what if they steal it for their game? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. It's just a game. And so, you know, they're gonna do it their own way. And so many of the stories like we talked about all go back to the hero story model anyway. So there's yeah. only so many ways you can tweak that or spice it up, you know, in so many different ways. So what I think what's more important isn't that you try to be different is that you execute it well. I think that's yeah. really what it boils down to is how you execute. Like that makes all the difference. Like the delivery of it, those sorts of things matter so much more than how quote unquote original it really is. Yeah, I wrote, I played Dungeon Master to Home game for a really specific group of people. And one of the encounters was so hilarious. I had one of the guys in tears, laugh crying, <laughs> and Deborah Ann Wall was, loved it so much. She was like, "Hey, I I would like to, I don't want to I don't want you to think I'm stealing this from you, but I loved this idea and I would like to elaborate on it for relics and rarities. Like, mm -hmm. can't is it okay?" And I'm like, "Well, first of all, thanks for asking, but you know <laughs> that's once it's out there, that's for you to take." And she ended up uh, using it. And making it even cooler than I could imagine. It was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she blew my mind with it. Um, but it was it was really cool because we all inspire each other. Mm -hmm. And the more we talk to each other and the more we like enhance what we all do, the better stories are going to be. Yeah. True. In my opinion. I agree. And, and you know, the other element of that, and we were saying that all stories have been told. And they're all tying back to that hero story. I mean, ultimately speaking, it, it's all about life. You know, it's it's about our dreams and our hopes and our and our fears and our aspirations. You know, and that's the beautiful thing about this creation is that you come to realize how similar we all actually are, even with all of our differences. You know, we yeah. we all have these certain yeah. threads in common. Yeah. So. It's like I look back at my life and all the trauma and all the pain, all the good, right? Mm -hmm. If I didn't have all that, I would live here. Mm -hmm. If I didn't, but I have had all that darkness, mm -hmm. which makes me more appreciate the light even more. But that also means I get to play all the way. I can write stories that are darker than anything you could imagine because I've lived it. Yeah. I live so many, not just with my dad, but other crazy things I got myself into mm -hmm. one day, everyone will hear about it. Um, and, but I can also play all the way in the light where I'm running charities for children. And it's, and it's really hard to do those things, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, I feel lucky mm -hmm. that I've allowed myself that possibility. Like I know what sexy is and I know what really sexy is. And I know what sad is. And I know what heart wrenching pain is. Mm -hmm. Um, I love feeling all of it and I would never change it. Oh, that's beautiful. We do have another special question coming in here from the chat. Oh boy. Somebody I think, you know, maybe a little bit looks like a uh, one David pancake is here in the chat and he's asking, he says he likes being a GM over playing. Do you prefer GMing or playing? Oh man. I think I prefer dungeon mastering mostly, mm -hmm. but there are some people that are like that game masters so well i'm just i love it when the game master um nate all the dwarven forge live stream games i just i play this like cannibal barbarian shifter and she's oh, the queen and she's like <laughs> eats her enemies to absorb their powers like she's 
totally insane. And, but he lets me go that far, you mm -hmm. know, and like, he's an animal and I'm an animal and I w put Stefan on my shoulders or his character on my shoulders and we kill things. <laughs> That's fun. Keith Baker. Oh my God. I just, I just want to play Ivan Van Norman. I just want to play like, but everyone else, I like the dungeon master. <laughs> Do do you find that like one kind of regenerates your battery for the other? Like by playing, then you feel like, hey, I'm, I want to DM again. And then when you DM, you're like, oh, I want to play again. Like, do you find it's like a yeah. cycle like that? Like you do one and the other and then you go back and forth and it, and it helps you out. Absolutely. Because if you're in too much control all the time, then you get like all weird cystic. And then you're like, oh, I'm just doing these things. But, you know, by playing with other people, you can feel what it's like when you're ignoring somebody else mm. or when they're ignoring you or yeah. if nobody's working together. Like, you know what it's like. So as a game master, you have, have the skills or, or the empathy, mm -hmm. right? You have right. the empathy and now the skills to navigate when somebody is feeling that. You're like, I recognize that feeling. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing it. Okay, this is not okay. Which reminds me, we're probably due to give Levi a break of uh, running games at some point. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I got one. I've got one I'm working up that he'll be able to play in soon. Yeah, I'll have to cook something up. I, I've Which, been out of the game for a while, so I, I I've been doing a little run of myself. I ran a one shot last week on Dad Bod D and D, and so mm -hmm. um, it's out there. It went up yesterday. It sounded like it YouTube, went pretty so well by all and it did. It went, it went quite well. I only killed one player. It was a little disappointing. <laughs> I, really thought oh, I, was I don't kill my players anymore. I maim the hell out of them. I, I thought I was going to maim some of them too, but it turns out only one of them got it. But um, <laughs> So let's see if we got any other questions coming in here from chat. I don't see any more at the moment. So are you about ready guys. to close this thing I out? I think we should let's probably start with some outros. So yeah. go ahead and take off first there, Jeff, and then we'll... Sure. Um, so I do mostly this stuff here with the wisdom check on usually Monday nights. So if you're here on Wednesday, thank you, because it's a little random day for us. Um, we also are doing a tabletop 5th edition game of uh, our own homebrew campaign that Levi runs. It's amazing. And we're playing this weekend, right? On Saturday? So you, you're playing Saturday. That's um, right. You're out of town. I'm be but... in Philadelphia with my guildmate. You guys are you guys are druidless. Uh, druidless which would going into elementals and wildness. But you know, yeah. I'm not much of a healer. I'm a pirate. So <laughs> it'll be fine. It's just gonna be a TPK. It's you're gonna come back to a new crew. It'll be fine. Next, next game after that'll be a next game after that'll be a Bower and Rescue mission to get everyone else <laughs> out of wherever they go. Um, but aside from that Dungeons and Dragons game and doing this show with Dustin and our awesome guest, uh, I also have a YouTube channel where I do mostly Let's Play content. So I've been playing a bunch of video games, whether it's Ark, Survival Evolved, whether it's, um, you know, various, you know, deep and hard, difficult games. Or what I've been playing recently is Pathfinder Kingmaker. So if you're interested in checking that out, uh, it's, it's a really interesting game. I, I really like it. I've been taking another stab at it on ludicrously hard difficulties and so you get to see me with my frustrated face and then my triumphant face when i finally get through stuff and it's a lot of fun so hopefully you uh hopefully you guys will enjoy that one check it out uh, over there on youtube i am rain survives so it's r-e-i-g-n survives and uh yeah it's good stuff i like doing it dustin what are you up to these days well when i'm not here on the wisdom check with jeff usually every monday not Wednesdays usually, Mondays, <laughs> 10 p.m. You can also find me in that same Everstorm game where I do play my druid pirate of the coast, Bower and Herald. Um, you also find me over at Plague State, where coming soon I'm going to be playing some video games up over there. In the meantime, here on TT2KB, we also have some Sea of Thieves we're going to be playing as a group. Um, we're also looking, we've been playing some Kill Squad because in case you were wondering where the keyboard part of TT2KB comes in, we play video games here as well. We don't just do tabletop. Also musicians. So. And all yeah, kinds musicians. Of stuff, so. we, get, we're, we get all kinds of talent up in this group doing all sorts of different <laughs> things. Um, you're going to be able to find us here on Monday with our guest Daniel D. Fox, the creative director of Zweihander, is going to be here. So if you don't know much about Zweihander, this would be a good chance for you to get to come and hear it right from the right from the man himself who who helped bring that game to life. It's um, gonna be awesome. We are going to be, and this is kind of crazy scheduling here, but we're going to have him on Monday, and then the next day, uh, Matt, 
uh, who we call Jowsum. He is uh, from Grim and Perilous Gaming. On his channel, he's going to be running us through their new module, Chateau. So you're going to get to see all of us here from TT2KB playing a one-shot game of Zweihander, and that will be next Tuesday. So we'll be, be uh, hosting it here. If you find us here, then that'll take you over there to his stream as well. So that is what we got coming up within the next week. All right. And then so 16. Let's let's plug some I'm of your 15. content yep, once tell again. Us where they can find you again. Um, well, you can find me at Sad Team Phoenix on pretty much everything. Check out GuildingLight.tv. But if you go to our Gilding Light Twitter, you mm -hmm. can get to the Discord. You can come hang out and talk with us on Discord. And um, I'll program you in the th I'm just learning Discord. <laughs> um, but every Sunday, we release a brand new, Sunday at noon Pacific, release a brand new storyteller's guide oh, and then cool. we re-release it on thursday we were on twitch and youtube and facebook so you can see it on all those platforms depending on whatever you would like and what you prefer because we don't limit um but it lives on if you want to see the previous episodes you can check them out on youtube or facebook and i'm um really happy to see you guys if you're at game hole con which if you're not you should um, come and take my, I'm doing a bunch of panels and courses, uh, live stream and yeah, there's all, I'm, I'm at game expo, expo, G A M E expo in October and whew, Busy I, schedule. Know, I think I need to recharge. <laughs> I got, yeah, there's gone every single weekend in October and I think I'm taking a va a real vacation. If anybody has any tickets to Burning Man, I need one ticket to Burning Man. <laughs> She's still looking for that Burning Man I ticket. Literally, I literally need to disconnect from everything. Mm -hmm. I need to have no access to anything. So please help me uh, find a ticket. I'm not asking anyone to pay for it. I just need to find it. <laughs> That's the hardest part. The so, super sleuths in our that. chat will be there for you. Um, yeah well, well that's awesome. the thing is um, I'm also accessible so please send me a direct message say hi like I I live on Twitter and that's awesome to know another thing yeah. here is we uh, as we outro I would like to take a moment and give a special thanks to uh, two socks from dad bod D&D &D, Matt from grim and perilous gaming and Chuck from defenders of cobalt for being our moderators tonight yes, thank you so make much sure the chat stays in line because you know <laughs> there could be some unruly people out there in the world <laughs> boy how do you we have none of that on here and um, also for helping gather up the questions that people have been asking them and putting them here into this fancy spreadsheet so I can keep track of them, make sure we get all of them in there. So I do thank them for taking their time out and coming here and uh, hanging with us. Some. Yeah, um, much appreciated, guys. <laughs> Got a sneeze. Bless you. <laughs> and a sneeze. <laughs> and a scared cat um, to boot. <laughs> you know, I, think, I think if everybody in chat would like to hang Bless on, you. I think we're going to raid somebody. And we got a guest Yay. coming up in a couple weeks, not next week, because we have Daniel D. Fox on. But the following week, a friend of ours, uh, Scuzz Nugget, is uh, going to be here on the show talking some D&D &D modules and how to homebrew them up a little yourself and add a little role playing to him. And so I'm going to see if we can't go ahead and raid Scuzz, because he's playing tonight. All right. Well, you got that for us on your end? working on it hold on awesome well satine thank you so very much appreciate your time appreciate your wisdom and uh hopefully our crowd here will stick around check out all your great stuff and check out where we're going next thanks guys right. thank you thank you steam